Hello. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Hey everybody. Um, we'll start in a bit. Uh, good morning, Abraham. This is uh, R. Sadil Kumar uh, from uh, IIT College Road. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, uh, everyone. Uh, Dr. Sendhil is one of our speakers, is actually our first speaker, and um, we will be um, giving him. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sendhil, you'll be sharing your screen in some time. Um, we'll, uh, how it goes is first, we'll just uh, provide the introduction and set the stage for uh, what's going to happen today, and then um, uh, once it's uh, all done, you'll share your screen and you will uh, be able to present. Uh, shall I start? No, not yet. Uh, another uh, five more minutes. Yeah, okay. That's why I'm going to share my screen, whether it is uh, um, uh, check whether it is visible to you or not. Shall I share, share the screen? Yeah, you can, you can just share and uh, we can see for a test. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, allow me to share my screen. Okay. Abraham, allow me to share my screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One second. I'm just trying to see where that is. Can you try it now? Can you try it now? Ah, yeah. Whether the screen is... Uh... Yeah, it's visible. It's visible now. Okay, uh, yeah, Ani, take it away. Yeah, okay. everyone and uh, welcome to MacPipers August webinar. Um, just a just a few quick introduction, like uh, ground rules, I guess, uh, for how we can we can make the best use of this particular platform. Um, so we'll be doing obviously this on this on Zoom, uh, where everybody will have access to speak up and and also chat. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put it up on the chat uh, during the presentation so as, as well. And uh, after the presentation, the speaker can take up the questions. Um, if you are if you are not speaking at the moment, just mute yourself so that it doesn't it it doesn't come in between the talk or somebody else is speaking. Um, do share like wh whatever questions you have, put it up there. If you want to ask it directly. Uh, at the end of at the end of the talk, when there will be the QA session, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions directly. Uh, you can obviously turn on your video or not; that's up to you. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, how, and yeah, if you want to do, if you want to, there's an option to raise hands as well, so you can do that um, and ask questions or something. Uh, now, uh, how many of you are very new to Bank Piper's event or webinar or um, like this is the first time to bank papers. This is just to test if the raise hands thing is working. If you can raise your hands. All right, I can see some raise hands. Nice. Uh, perfect, yeah, Samia, it's your first time, great. So a little bit about bank papers first and uh, according to our schedule, we should have started the first talk by 10.35. We'll just do it by 10.40 and so five minutes delay. Um, so a little bit about Bank Pipers. Bank Pipers is the Bangalore's Python users group, which means everything to Python we try to cover in this meetup. Um, it's all community driven and volunteer driven, obviously. Um, we're all trying to help uh, make this event as, as increasingly uh, accessible to everybody as possible. Um, due to obviously the pandemic reasons, we had to move uh, to an online setup. Otherwise, this event is uh, fixed on the th on the third Saturday or the second last Saturday of every month, 
So regardless of which month it is, we'll be here doing this. Um, if you want to present a talk or something, there's a link that we that we shared. You can submit your talk using that link. If you want to volunteer for this event, get in touch with either me, uh, Abhiram or Ritesh, who are also on this call. And you can also reach us on our mail IDs or on Slack or something. Um, yes, this event is also will be streamed on YouTube live. Now, a little bit about Py PyCon India. Uh, how many of you know about PyCon India in here? Or how many of you don't know about PyCon India? So PyCon India is the India's Python developers conference uh, where we try to, uh, where, where you'll, you'll get to meet actually a lot of international speakers and also prominent speakers from across the country. Um, due to obviously again the same similar reasons PyCon India this time is going online. So you'll be able to join from anywhere you want. And uh, you can obviously tag along. Uh, for the entire thing, you can meet other people, do network, and so on. Um, the CFP, like the call for proposals for the talks, is unfortunately over, so you can't submit a talk now if you want. Um, there will obviously be a lightning talk session during the conference, so if you have you know five minutes of talk, something you can do that. Um, the CFP for workshops is still open though, and the tickets are open. So the early bird tickets are unfortunately sold out already. The regular tickets are still open, so you can get your tickets. Uh, since it's online, the prices are slashed very, very low. So it's definitely uh, affordable and you can join from it. That's pretty much it. If you have any questions regarding bank papers of Icon India, do shoot, do shoot out in the chat. Uh, chat. Uh, we'll be here to answer it and take it forward. Now, let me present to you Dr. R. Senthil. He is the Assistant Professor of uh, Electronics and Communication Engineering. Uh, from the Institute of Road and Transport Technology, Tamil Nadu. Um, Dr. Sentin, uh, would you just like to start? Whether uh, <coughs> my voice is audible? Yes, you are audible. Whether the screen, uh, shared screen is visible to you? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. R. Sundil Kumar, Assistant Professor, Institute of Road and Transport Technology. Abhirgam uh, or Anirudh, if you, if you feel my voice is not audible or uh, my data rate uh, is getting slowed down, uh, you, you please interrupt me and uh, uh, give me uh, indication that uh, some voice is not audible or uh, data uh, something, uh, video is not uh, good or PPT is not visible like that. Okay. Sure, thanks, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to give you a talk on uh, uh, still image and video processing applications using Python. Uh, R. Sundar Kumar, Ashram Professor, Institute of Product and Transport Technology, Erode, Tamil Nadu. Right. So what are the Python libraries, uh, libraries uh, software packages are necessary for uh, still image and video processing? Python 3.7, Matplotlib. NumPy, SciPy, Pillow, OpenCV, uh, Python 3.7 and above, uh, uh, okay. And uh, you have to install other libraries like Matplotlib, NumPy, SciPy, Pillow, and OpenCV. NumPy, SciPy for uh, numeric and scientific computations, and uh, for uh, uh, small, uh, simple image processing, you can uh, do it with the help of Matplotlib. Uh, for, uh, small advanced applications, you can do it with Pillow. Uh, Python library, and you can uh, use more advanced still image and video processing applications using OpenCV. So uh, these are the web, uh, web links you, from uh, where, from where you can download uh, uh, the software packages. Python 3.7 from Python.org, Matplotlib, and you can install using pip command also using uh, pip, pip command, NumPy, SciPy, Pillow, and OpenCV. Once you install Python 3.7, you can install other uh, Python libraries using pip command. Python, the download Python latest version from python.org, install Python in Windows in any drive. After installation, check whether it is properly installed or not in your system using the command, right? Uh, here I am, I am here, uh, uh, here uh, I am installed my Python in a, a D program files, Python uh, 37, uh, that is the root directory for Python. Uh, here I am in invoking Python, whether the Python is properly installed or not. I am checking that uh, whether it is properly installed or not, uh, just by typing Python. And it shows some uh, message like this, Python 3.7 version of uh, Python installed in my system. Uh, and uh, it shows some prompt like this, this like this. Like this prompt, 
website um, and install numpy scipy matplotlib using the uh, um, command python hyphen uh, m pip install numpy python hyphen m pip install scipy python hyphen m pip install matplotlib like this and check whether the whether those packages are properly installed in your uh, uh, system uh, using the command like that uh, for invoking by uh, invoke python and uh, type import numpy type import scipy import matplotlib if, if they are properly installed in your system it does not show any uh, it, it will not uh, uh, give you any error message, uh, messages if it is properly installed uh, uh, if it is not properly installed it will show some uh, error messages right uh, uh, library is not found like that uh, in, in order to install uh, opencv you have to use the command pip install opencv hyphen python if you want to more uh, uh, opencv models uh, uh, more uh, opencv models new packages you have to use pip install opencv country hyphen uh, python uh, this model uh, this model right so, so for uh, uh, simple and, uh, and um, advanced applications uh, open cp is enough if you want to do later latest image passing algorithms like uh, machine learning algorithms like, like that you got to use this command you can install open cp hyphen country hyphen python check whether open cp properly installed in your system using the command uh, command uh, import cp2 so what are the access here? Here I am going to discuss in still image processing using matplotlib and below Python libraries. A simple image read and display, pseudo color image, pseudo color image, color bar, image resizing, image interpolation, RGB to gray image, color image to gray image, histogram plot, copying a portion of an image, shape of an image, and grayscale conversion, image transform, image filtering, image details, and changing for image file format. These are the total access we are going to see in uh, use, uh, using Python libraries like matplotlib and below right so this one is the copyright image i am using for image passing applications right okay uh, this one is the output of access number one simple image read and uh, uh, show image show and this one is the output of uh, program number two access number two pseudo color image uh, this one is the output of uh, um, uh, third program Uh, Dr. Sindhil, your audio cut out, if you are seeing anything. We can't hear you. He's also, yeah, I think he's frozen. Maybe the image is processing. Can't rule that out. Oh, it wouldn't be a successful meeting without some technical difficulties, right? So, pardon the glitches, folks. So while Dr. Sathir is trying to rejoin, um, it's a quick, quick announcement that this, this, particular, this particular webinar will not be streamed online, but we are recording it, so we'll put it up on YouTube later on. You can have it on your Bank Bankers YouTube channel. In the meantime, also you can probably respond on chat. How many of you have actually worked with image processing in the past? Just probably say me or okay, Altanai, Bikash. 
Okay, so um, hey, can you like uh, provide uh, you, now? You can probably unmute yourself and uh, talk a little bit about uh, like what you've done, so that it's probably setting us up for knowing what you can possibly talk about in future meetups, right? Like uh, this is the first time we are actually doing something on image processing, so it is a bit bright. Uh, so can you just tell a little bit? Maybe Altana, you can go first. I think Santhil is trying to call me. Just oh, allowed. I just allowed a new door, but I'm not sure. Uh, Altana, can you try speaking now? Hi, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I am basically trying to uh, do uh, image processing to identify uh, recyclable and non-recyclable garbage, and I've been at it since last almost one and a half years. Uh, what I'm doing is there are some existing OpenCV uh, XML filters for bottle, uh, pedestrian, uh, basic, existing. So I just uh, capture images from Raspberry Pi and uh, convert them into black and white uh, low quality images and then run them through the algorithm. So that's where I'm right now. That's why I'm trying to uh, learn more about image processing so I can better identify different kinds of garbage. Oh, that is excellent. Uh, and that is actually one of the topics that will be prime for a talk here, I think, because it is a journey, right? And um, when you are discovering stuff, it is possible that people who might have done something related can help you out as well. Or people who haven't done something can be, be you know, encouraged by what you are doing. So it's very nice. And uh, I'd like to talk to you later after this to learn about when you can possibly present. And uh, who else was there? I think Kanishk and uh, there was B. Someone whose name started with B. Bikash. Yes, Bikash, can you go on? I think uh, Dr. Sendhil reached out. He'll be back in around six to seven minutes. His laptop restarted. Uh, do I have to unmute you as well? Yeah, I have unmuted you. Hello. Yes, Bikash. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I've been attending uh, quite a few sessions. Uh, so my computer vision journey started uh, back when I was in uh, college. Uh, there with some of my friends, we started out with the basic CNN models uh, for uh, classification of images. There, the main objective was to uh, make a ASL detection application where people could just use their hands to type in keywords and use it as a replacement of hand uh, type keywords because people with visual aids uh, don't can't see and they just uh, use their hands and apart from that uh, recently i delved into segmentation and units and deeper uh, segmentation i mean deeper cnn models uh, most importantly i guess in these things uh, deployment is a big thing so i discovered onx uh, recently which speeds up your model in deployment so these are the things I've been working. I'm sorry. What was that last thing you said? Uh, what uh, What was? Uh, I recently discovered ONX uh, deploy. I mean ONX uh, runtime optimization thing. Okay. So uh, it's it's like a it's it's uh, like a Microsoft open source thing. Uh, I thought that main. I mean, because of some uh, biased blocks and stuff. Uh, I thought that it was just a, a common ground for all models to come in. Like, for example, you have a Keras model, you have a TensorFlow model, you have a PyTorch model. You want it to deploy uh, in such a way that it is uh, hardware independent, a common ground for all models to be deployed. Uh, but they also provide their uh, own optimization, and that optimization is really good. I mean, mm. it provided a really good performance improvement. Nice. So, I think we are all a bit uh, wary of proprietary. Yeah. Uh, offerings and uh, we don't trust them as much as yeah, sometimes yeah. we can, right? I, I yeah, yeah. got it. Yeah, it's ON and X, right? I just, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, this this also sounds like something that would be prime. I mean, I I really think uh, we should have another session. Uh, Kanish, you can go next. Should I unmute? Yeah, I can. Uh, 
Okay, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so for me, image processing, it's been quite a long journey for me in image processing. So I have worked on like very basics of image processing using like CRFs and CRFs and also on the CNN part recently, like uh, if you are all aware, like CNN has been completely like taken over and almost to solve the problems which we knew like uh, hard to solve. Now, as you see, like uh, earlier the problems were like to classify image to just classify cats and dogs. Now CNN has like taken it to deep or not even I won't see even CNN. It's like a deep neural nets, right? They have taken it to the extent now we are generating images of cats and dogs. You just, like if you would have seen like Nvidia's uh, recent, I think last year, 2019, late uh, around December, they published their uh, software. You just scribble it out, it will draw you a picture, complete pictures in scenery or a cat or a dog. So, for my experience uh, as a mission, so I started around like four years back. Very first was like uh, as a college project, image classifications. That's where basically I got a addiction, I would say, for this thing. And as I kept going into it, like read you read latest papers they are publishing. Uh, now, uh, CNN is also like a, it's like a wide journey. It's a, you start with like basically you start with say blurring techniques. It's like a basic image processing. Even if you try to start with you start with like just handcrafting those features for, for doing your classification. Then you also start as you evolved as a journey like you evolve from this stage when you are used to handcrafting the feature struggling with what features to put in for a like a simple SVM classifier then you come to a neural net deep neural net where you will see like uh, the features getting generated itself and you say you also put a like a SVM classifier at the end of that network then you also get to visualize what features so earlier when you used to craft handcraft feature you might not get an intuition what they these features are exactly representing they will be just an image you converting it to a number now you come to CNNs you can actually plot those things. You get a visualization what exactly you were actually extracting out there. So that's uh, I think uh, it's uh, hard to put in words like this, but yeah. So it's uh, like a very fascinating technology. And if uh, I would recommend, if any one of you is interested, like just go to their websites like Papers with Code. They have like latest state of the art, cutting edge papers coming out in this field. And, basic segmentation, classification, even in normal image processing in non basic image processing, even like, uh, uh, so there are like, uh, people are doing like, work. so uh, some is like, uh, you get some raw images, you uh, like a rough image, you try to sharpen them up, basically like in increasing their like pixelarities and uh, some are basically just doing reconstructing the whole image, like deleting some, say you took a picture, some your uh, some hand who got deleted or blurred out. They'll be running like image processing techniques to just complete out the whole picture. Yeah. Right. No. Oh, yeah. So I think you touched on something very important when you said that you know you uh, once you got interested, you started looking at papers in that uh, field. Right. That is something that yeah. I think people are again intimidated by. Um, Present like myself included in whatever field that we are trying to learn from, right? Because we think that we are at a certain level where documentation is helpful, but papers are at a different level. I don't think yes. that uh, I'm alone in feeling that, right? Yeah, but so I, that, that's what my reaction was like a very first paper. When I started to, to read papers, it used to take me like uh, almost a week to actually fully understand that paper. <laughs> I would be like, why I have to read it? I just go through some blog. But when you get into habit of it, you can just finish it in a lay three, four hours, depending on the paper complexity ideas they are presenting, but that's where you keep yourself updated. Like as I mentioned, that's one website you should check it out. That's a, like a pretty cool website for every tech related to um, NLP, CNN, basic image processing, normal speech recognition, everything in state of the art is there. You will find the Python codes for that. Mostly a Python TensorFlow models, PyTorch models, or basically even code implementation you will find there. The second out that will be, I think a good, start if you haven't already and if you have already then that can be also added to your collection nice um yeah. and uh, yeah kanishk will have you also speak in the second round of image processing talks i think yeah, uh, if you are up to it uh, actually a uh, bit of trivia that no one asked for kanishk is actually my colleague uh, and i uh, just told him that we are having this session on image processing i did not ask him um, his expertise in the field, I should have in hindsight. Uh, 
yeah so okay when i is saying there is also a website where you can learn how to read tech papers it's like blinkist for tech is that the thing no no so that's a paper with code is basically you get, you have a paper you will have a code implementation available to you as well it's not all paper publishers they publish their code right so on that website you will find like all the related links all the various part all sorts of models someone has implemented for that paper no no uh, vinay kirti on the chat he is saying uh, oh, that okay. there is a website where you can learn how to read tech papers ah okay yeah how to read technical papers nice thanks vinay um let's see if dr sandar is back so is that, that's one that's very as well actually when i have gone through this when i was also starting i was actually going through all this how to read papers one thing i figured out you go through it uh but over a period of time right when you go through so many of this processes it's a your habit you will develop how to not everyone would be able to follow so even i asked my like professors how do you actually read papers that was i think that was my one of my first questions i asked when i started i just went to my professor it's taking me one week i can't read it like i can't read you have given me three four papers just how do i read this that's when he yeah so right. it will you you guys will develop like over a period of time it will take you like 100 150 papers i'm not saying it's going to take like two three papers you will be able to just pick it up it will it's going to take you over 100 papers if you're going to get that level like just four five hours you have to finish a paper of something right no definitely it's a, it's a habit it's like exercising a muscle like anything else Yes. Basically, you over a period of time now you get used to like what sections you have to focus on, what fair sections you will be used to like doing some mental calculations as well over a period of time. Right. Where is this? Yeah, that's it. I'll mute myself. Thanks, Abraham. Sure, Ganesh. Uh, I think we all benefited from this. Uh, okay, I think Doctor Sendil is uh, being. having more difficulty than expected we'll probably come back to him sonam are you there and uh, can you start presenting if you are set up for it already or did you need a bit more time so sonam bangaj is our second speaker uh, and if she is not there it's i think it's understandable because the time isn't hmm. okay while we wait for our scheduled second speaker to start maybe okay oh sorry okay sonam is not able to unmute herself my god we are full of difficulties today one second let me unmute you can you speak now sonam hey Uh, are you able to hear me yes i'm sorry okay. that's why uh, yeah yeah okay sure so should i share my screen yes please okay. is there any noise in the background uh, because i have my fans on so i can close that actually there is i think but uh, if you can if you can move closer to the mic can uh, over okay okay no worries uh are you able to see my screen yes Um, uh, am I able to get into another notebooks? Hello. Yes, we can see you. That we can see that you are on a notebook. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You might have to speak up a bit. Uh, hello. Yes. Is it fine? Yes, it is better. Yeah. So, hello everyone. Uh. I'm Sonam. I work as a software lead at Solina Synthetic, which is an incubated company at IIT Madras. I was also an ex-visiting faculty for robotics and computer vision at PS University, uh, and uh, I gave some talk, uh, tech talks at PyCon and PyData. PyCon last year and PyData this year. So I will be talking about lossy and lossless compression. Um, 
So any one of you already know about lossless compression? Uh, there's a famous uh, TV series on lossless compression, as you all know. Hello. Uh, I would like to be more interactive a little bit. Yeah, I, I think uh, as far as interaction goes, uh, I don't know. Like, I think the chat will have to be on. Oh, OK, OK. So uh, we can do that later. Yeah, I, I can um, moderate accordingly. So Kumar Gaurav is saying Pied Piper. Is that the one? Uh, <laughs> Silicon yeah, Valley. Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, so yeah, let's uh, see the difference between lossy and lossless compression and all those little gardens that are behind. So uh, in lossy compression, it eliminates the amount of data from your source. So if your source is an image source, it will eliminate uh, some, it will uh, randomly pick up uh, some uh, pixels and it will eliminate. But yeah, you can uh, devise ways uh, of uh, how you want to eliminate the pixel. So there are algorithms that you want to uh, remove unwanted, unnoticeable uh, kind of pixels. So uh, th there are, are algorithms in lossy compression that eliminates only unnoticeable pixels. And in lossless compression, there's uh, the reconstitution of data after compression. So the data is not lost in any of the pipeline, but it is uh, reconstructed. Uh, so algorithms in lossy compressions are uh, your uh, lossy compression transform uh, transform coding. We will see discrete cosine transform uh, how they work. Uh, actually, discrete uh, cosine transform is uh, what we need, but the process is known as fast Fourier transform to achieve discrete uh, cosine transform. Uh, there are factor compression, etc. Uh, for lossless compression, there are Huffman encoding and there are other uh, uh, limpers of uh, which you use in JP, JPEG images. So application of compression. So compression are used everywhere from storing images on your drive. Uh, actually comp companies want more compression to save data on cloud. Uh, they are video streaming, uh, video conferencing, YouTube uh, user as a vast majority of compression and Zoom also uses a, a lot of compression for, uh, for making it uh, more, uh, you know, um, faster streaming to uh, or scale the streaming to people. So compression is, uh, application of compression is everywhere, especially on cloud, streaming services, etc. So today we will be compressing this image. This is a famous image by Nagio. Uh, so we, we, we are using this image because there's a lot of contrast in colors. There are different textures you can see. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of things to play around. So the first algorithm we will be discussing is uh, single value decomposition. So single value decomposition is very uh, quite a famous algorithm for linear algebra. Uh, so you can use it for extracting key features, uh, understanding data, tailoring data. Uh, even regression uses a lot of single value decomposition. Uh, and there's PCA. PCA is basically your principal component analysis, which divides the whole data into two two axes uh, where the, the data is varying the most and the, where, where the data is varying the least. So all these uh, algorithms, PCA mostly, which is very dominant in data reduction, uses your SVD algorithms for finding the key, relation, key relationship between the uh, points. Okay, so what basically SVD is? So it, SVD, does your matrix decomposition into three parts. Okay, first is uh, your U, uh, U hat, your sigma, and V, v transpose. So you don't need to go in deep in uh, this part, but uh, if you want, I can just uh, you know, kind of scratch. So if, if there's an image and there are n, e, m number of images and there are n number of pixels, suppose there's one megapixel, uh, image there, so uh, there are one megapixels uh, elements here. So it will decompose into U, Sigma, and V transpose. Uh, where U and V are your unitary matrix and Sigma is like your covariance where maximum data variance is happening. So basically it sums up, but the fact is uh, here when it sums up, 
these are the major data so your first column is your is where your maximum data is getting saved your first row is where the maximum data is getting saved and your first uh, uh, sigma one is where the maximum data of getting saved so so overall this this part is where maximum data of of the image is getting saved uh, okay so that is about SV. There's a lot about SVD. If you go deeper into, there are many uh, papers on SVD you can go around. But uh, th there are many applications, as I told you, it is used in regression, PC, and everything. So basically, what SVD does, it is decomposed into three matrices. Uh, first, being your eigenfaces, which is the most important uh, of uh, all the data. So yeah, before going into the results, we will just uh, look into a notebook of SVG compression. So we Swaram, use, yeah. Swaram, the, the amplitude of your voice has fallen down. Okay, can oh. you can you speak a bit up or can you speak closer to the mic maybe? Uh, uh, yeah, there's no, not a mic, it's a headphone. Oh, okay. So, is it okay now? Uh, Hello? Yeah. I. I Possibly. Uh, can everyone hear? Like, if you can just say yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Good enough. Good enough. Good enough. Okay. So, yeah, please go on. Yeah. So, for uh, we took a uh, like basic example. If you want to take, uh, we can just read the image using matplotlib image. We can plot it. An NumPy for your matrix uh, manipulation. Uh, the most famous, uh, you can say, at the library uh, OS for reading from the folder. Okay, so we plotted the uh, the image here. Now you can see we can just import the library uh, from NumPy called Linear Algebra SVD. You can just import the library, give it the X, the matrix, and it will decompose into U, S, and VT. S has to be diagonals. So all the diagonals in the images should uh, be present. So uh, we basically made it for R. So what is R here? So R is your, I, as I told you, our first uh, row contains most of the information. So we are taking up to R. R may be 100, 20, uh, 5, anything. So uh, we have uh, done it for uh, three uh, elements, five, twenty, and hundred. So we can see if we take five number of R, like uh, 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 five rows. So we can see is we cannot see at, uh, very clearly uh, when R twenty. It's uh, quite uh, quite uh, understandable which image it is, and R hundred is your uh, quite, but it is in compressed uh, image. So the uh, compressed. Uh, Form. So this is this data is only 10% or 12% of the original image that you have seen here. But there's not much difference you can see. So uh, yeah, so at R100, even there's 10% of the data available. Uh, it's not much difference from the original data. So yeah, here we have plotted. So you can see for uh, 0 to 200 is the maximum data that is getting sa saved as a, a singular values. So yeah, so that's why single value decomposition uh, kind of uh, tells you uh, where the maximum data is. And uh, till K100 I have taken, you can K, uh, take it K200, but there will not be much difference uh, than this. So this was a single value decomposition. Uh, now we will get into Fourier transform. So in Fourier transform, what happens? It reconstitutes the wave, the waveform. So uh, whatever wavelength uh, wave you give it, it can uh, decompose the wave into its reconstituent. So it might not be very visual, uh, like visual for you for, but. Uh, there is a YouTube video called uh, Three Blue and One, uh, One Brown, I guess. Yeah, Three Blue and One Brown Fast Fourier Transform, where you can visualize it, how it happens. So, so suppose these are the wavelengths and we want to reconstitute its uh, original waveforms.
yeah so to, your two hertz can be represented as this your three hertz can be represented in fast Fourier space as this and summation can give you this. so either you constitute this data and get to your uh, waveform or you can get from this waveform to this constituent uh, constituent data so basically what for, uh, So it's kind of transforming data into a different uh, form. Uh, I can tell you, uh, this is the transforms uh, that is used in fast Fourier. So uh, basically this is also arranging the data into matrices of in maximum importance to minimum in importance, uh, but in a, a form of transform. So basically what it looks like is this. So if this is your uh, fast Fourier transform, your image so your images will be say pixels will be saved like this and there will be a threshold of maximum data importance to minimum data importance so only this one percent is being used in the fast Fourier transform others are kind of uh, thrown away so in fast Fourier transform you can uh, if you uh, present the data as a plot you can see the intensities on the images and uh, uh, kind of when you uh, see it from the surface plot you can see the how the images has been uh, kind of stored as a waveform so for get the, we can just check uh, how fast we transforms so here we have used uh, your uh, grayscale image itself uh, we have again from uh, NumPy we have imported FFT and FFT2 uh, so if we keep only 0.1% of data we can see this kind of images has come 0 0.05 and 0.01% but we can still kind of know what kind of image is it So here you can see the comparison, uh, keeping 0.1% of the data uh, of the image, keeping 0.05% of the uh, data on the image and keeping 0.01% of the data in the images. So these tools are already there to, uh, and fast Fourier transform is used very, uh, very widely for, uh, from the research communities, to kind of fit the curve or get derivatives, denoise data, uh, analyze data, and compression. So yeah, these are the two most widely used algorithms, SVD and fast Fourier transform, uh, for your compression of the data. Um, any question if you have, you can ask now, hello. There are quite a few questions on the chat. Yeah. Anybody who's uh, yeah. willing to put your hands and you can ask one by one. Or I'll probably like read them out and then the person uh, who has asked it will um, be able to talk for himself or herself. Uh, so we'll go reverse order. So V Viswana is asking, what is the percentage of saving that you get from a compression with FFT via uh, versus uh, SVD? Yeah, so here you can see only 0.1% of data has been saved. Here uh, in SVD, ten, uh, like 10% of the data is there, 10%. So you can, uh, amount saved in the FFT is more than uh, you can save in SVD, single validity composition. Um, Viswa, is that a, did you get your answer or? Um, yeah. yeah, what I also wanted to understand is basically there's a bit of encoding and decoding that happens, right? So uh, what is the overhead between the SPD versus FFT? Overhead, uh, I think 10% maybe uh, this, uh, kind of FFT 
encodes more of 10%, uh, like 10% more efficient, you can say, than SVD. Okay. So, so you were saying primarily <clears throat> a lot of these compression techniques are used to save disk space yeah. uh, in, you know, pretty much uh, mostly uh, companies which uses a lot of pictures, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, but these uh, fast Fourier transform can also be used to compress audio files. Uh, if, so yeah, there's no video file, audio file, images, uh, any kind of files can be used. I but understand. If you understand. compress audio, its its quality is decreased. So Spotify has come up with a, a kind of a plan that gives you same quality of audio. But if you uh, listen the same kind of audio on YouTube, it is kind of degraded. If you see the difference between Spotify and YouTube songs, so yeah, so they there uh, they haven't used much of compression or maybe better compression, I guess. So in audio, it is also there. Okay, yeah, thanks. So I think somehow serendipitously we have got an answer that uh, to Saurabh's question as well. He asked, "Can it be applied to audio?" And uh, I think the principles do apply there, right? FFTs yeah. are used for compression there as well. Yeah, so it's quite uh, interesting that you can reconstitute the the type of waveform just by analyzing it with FFT. So there are various. It 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 seems very simple. It could take more uh, you know complex uh, complexities into terms. It's just analyzing your center of center of mass, how it is uh, changing with respect to your uh, uh, frequencies. So if the frequency is one beats per second, two beats per seconds, and that's how it is changing and reconstituting. Hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So Bikash has a comment saying three blue, one brown is a great channel. Yes, I think uh, it, it's been spoken about once last year as well. I don't remember who brought it up. Uh, there was a talk that we had at Call Hub and uh, someone had referred to it. I think it was Purusharth Saxena who, uh, when in his talk, he had mentioned it. I don't know if he's on this call today, but uh, yeah. Um, Okay, we'll go through a couple more questions uh, before we come to Bingman. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, so sure. Anirudh is asking, each column in the matrix is an image or a vector. Uh, this, I think this is around the third slide. Uh, I'm not sure which slide. Anirudh, uh, you can speak up. Yeah, so this was uh, before this, I think, uh, where you had the, okay, this was on the sketchpad, yeah. Yeah. So this is the image uh, and it constitutes of your n pixels and your m, m uh, there are not m data so like if there are many other images it could be happening. Yeah, so each column is an image, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, column uh, each each image takes a row and a column, right? So you can interpret it as a matrix with pixel intensity from zero to 255, 255 being dark and zero being uh, typically light. That is yeah. how the computers or the GPUs see. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think that's a transformed one, right? So you're transforming an image uh, matrix into a column vector. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I think maybe, I don't, I don't want to say it's the one last question, but Sachin is asking, um, what effect does a lossless compression have on object recognition accuracy? Uh, maybe Sachin, if you want to elaborate on the question or if Sonam, you've already got it. Yeah, uh, can, can you elaborate a little bit more? Uh, yeah, Sachin. Uh, so the, so uh, you can see here, both, both the uh, algorithms are kind of uh, throwing away some data based on their importance. Okay, so both the algorithms are lossy compression itself. Uh, lossless compression kind of store data in a data data structure form. Uh, if you can see Huffman uh, Huffman coding, it uh, store the data like a tree. So yeah, 
so both of the, the algorithms are lossy uh, based on the importance of pixel they are keeping the data or throwing the data got it i mean um, we are uh, we are trying out uh, uh, template matching with uh, open cv and uh, we have a lot of templates to go through uh, for for checking an object it's not exactly uh, a machine learning there so i was wondering if i use lossless compression will i be able to match plates faster if i mean if you if you got it okay so uh, if once the data is compressed uh, you are saying right Correct. so uh, yeah you cannot find the variables once data is compressed it is it is you can, uh, if you want to search something you can uh, only search in a in a form where the pixels are present already okay. you uh, not in the compressed space so it's mm -hmm. Either you have to restore, reconstruct the pixels, or uh, basically you cannot make search in the compressed Fair data enough. space. Fair enough. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, Sonam. I think if there are no more questions, you can talk about. Uh, you can you can check the GitHub if uh, you want. If you want to check the code, use it. Oh, yeah. Nice. So this is your GitHub uh, profile. Okay. Yeah. So what we will do so is we will also put up the. Yeah. And you can go. In the and post post notes, we will be putting up all the links for whatever is available. If you uh, have so any Sonam, doubt, you can yeah. contact me on this Gmail also. Sonapankaj2 at the rate gmail dot com. And this is my Twitter account. And yeah, so uh, Sonam also has a pet project she's been working on called the Bing Man. So yeah, Sonam, you can talk about it now. It's also using Python. Yeah, sure. So I need kind of, uh, you know, help from the developers community to make it better. So uh, we, uh, we kind of uh, came up with the idea. When we're in college, we used to kind of uh, take advices from our colleagues or uh, our friends in hostels which which uh, which movie we want to watch and all so we have tried to reconstruct the whole experience through binge map and uh, here you can also kind of add it to the favorite list or watch letter or watched and you can recommend to your friends so suppose uh, larry has a friend sonam so i can recommend uh, her the movie and you can find similar movies and you can review the movie itself here so yeah uh, the second part is my binges it kind of got i got recommendation from some uh, some of my friends so i can go and check that if my friend has recommended a movie i can go and check my favorite movies over here uh, watch 10 watch later list uh, you also have a friend uh, page where you can see the activities of your friend, what kind of movies or TV series uh, they have been watching. Or, uh, I personally love friends, so I can kind of go and check where it is uh, streaming right now or uh, yeah, I recommend review the, uh, the series as well. So it's a kind of website where uh, you can take the whole college experience of sharing movies and so right now it's a, it's in a beta stage and we would like to get uh, more uh, kind of feedbacks uh, on the kind of uh, performance how the site is performing uh, how what can we do to make it better the ui and everything else so if anyone is interested to do the beta testing they can go and then they they can send me the feedbacks on my email or we can we can talk uh, what what else can be done at this point if so i understand that this is on django right yeah uh, so a little bit about the uh, framework Stack. so uh, we have made it on the django framework so django makes it very easy for you to uh, uh, make a I can say like a, a person based or customer based or people based sites. So if, uh, if you see Instagram and YouTube both are 
on Django framework. And Django basically works on your Python, uh, Python framework. So it becomes quite easy for you to make it uh, movie movie centered or people centered. So uh, I can uh, I can make it fan centered or I can make it movie centered. So these kind of things becomes very easy with Django. Uh, I can add features. I can see where it is streaming. Uh, all this. Uh, you can add information or uh, if you want to add more movies you can easily just run a command and then do it so django makes it very easy to be centered around people people centered apps and websites so yeah uh, this was about the benchman and if anyone is interested uh, they can take uh, a beta test is there any way they can get in touch with you if they are interested in terms of contributing to the code? I, I know that you are working uh, yeah. on it on a personal capacity right now, maybe yeah. friends or something, but, uh, and I know it's not open source, but if you are looking for contributors or. Yeah, we have, a Slack. we have a Slack uh, uh, channel, so I can share you the link or where you can contact or uh, I can, uh, my WhatsApp number, Telegram numbers are already there. So WhatsApp. We can share that separately. Uh, so uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Okay, okay, sure. All right. Uh, okay, now I think uh, Dr. Sendhil is back and uh, I think we'll let him uh, complete what he started despite the technical difficulties because just, um, so everyone uh, is fine with loss. Is there any further questions uh, on the compression side? In any case, uh, even if you do have doubts, uh, and if you if they occur later on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sonam has provided a lot of uh, contactability and uh, sure she can be contacted via us or directly as well. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Sendhil, you can take the stage next. Let's hope second time is a charm. Uh, but uh, Dr. Sendhil, I do have a request uh, to uh, make it fair to the third speaker. Uh, I would request that uh, your talk will have to uh, wind up by 12.5, that, okay. that is 35 minutes from now, so that okay. the third speaker can start without any interruptions. Right? Is that okay. fine? Okay. okay. There is a echo. Is that just on my side? No, I think he's connected on two devices. Ah, okay, okay. There is connected to you. Yes, the screen is visible. Yep. You'll have to go into slide mode, doctor. Sir, whether the uh, sir, 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 the whether the sir, 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 Shall I start now? Yes, please go on. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. The, this is a R R R R Sandhu Kumar Ashton Kumar Ashton Minister of Rural and Minister of Rural and Transport Technology. Uh, this is. Um, uh, okay, sorry for the inter uh, interruption. Here I am going to start with the. Uh, here I am going to start with the, uh, uh, what I looked here. I think you can uh, continue with the fourth slide. I think I mean like the installation of packages. Yeah. I think people are fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Uh, these are the access the access we are going to uh, see uh, in this talk. Uh, 
uh, basic image processing using MATLAB flip and uh, pillow python libraries, libraries image read and display pseudo color image pseudo color image color bar image resizing image interpolation the color to gray image histogram plot cropping a portion of an image shape of an image and grayscale conversion image transform image filtering image details and changing image file format this one is the sample copyright image i have for image processing output of x size one simple image read and display pseudo color image output of uh, x size two color image with color bar output of x size three uh, image resizing and uh, image interpolation and uh, conversion of color image into grayscale image histogram plot excess number seven output excess number eight output cropped image from the original image and uh, separating blue matrix green matrix red matrix from the original color image and uh, flipping uh, left to right output of excess turn number one and fl uh, and uh, flip top to bottom output of axis number 10th axis second second program output rotate 90 degree output rotate 180 degree rotate 270 degree and uh, gaussian blur filtering output minimum filter output median filter output and unshock mass filter output and uh, image uh, file for format conversion jpeg to png image file format conversion if you want more tutorials, refer uh, uh, YouTube link given here. And uh, uh, image processing is in open CV. Read a color image and display an image. These three access are corresponding to still image processing using open CV. And uh, output of access one, access two. XS3 converting color image into gray image using OpenCV Python library and uh, vertical stacking, horizontal stacking and uh, rotating color image and uh, cropping the original image. Uh, if you want to refer uh, more information or more tutorial, refer my you. Uh, refer my video tutorial in YouTube posted and uh, video processing open CV capture a color video from web camera capture a color video from web camera and convert to gray video uh, capture Dr. a color video and get its frame with hello doctor just a second uh, I, I think uh, the, the mapping of I mean so to speak the mapping of questions to answers I think it's, it's extremely uh, difficult for uh, at least me to follow. So what will be helpful is uh, if you can uh, have one. I'm going to, I, I to run that on those program. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think we should go there because the reason is uh, to do full justice. I don't think we can remember all of them before we get there, right? So I think we can go okay. there. Huh? Okay. Okay. I, I already sent all those programs to Abraham uh, uh, yesterday itself. Uh, if you want, I am I, 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 going to share in the chat itself. Yeah, I am going to run all those programs. Okay, okay, let's go on. Yeah, yeah let's go on. Yeah. Uh, play uh, uh, already recorded video. Capture a video using web camera. Flip that video. Converting color video into gray video. Converting color video to gray, gray and gray to binary, binary video. Video blurring. Video resize and interpolation followed video blurring, edge reduction, video masking, histogram equalization, equalization, video image transform, video motion detection. Here I am going to run the image pass seeing using Map plot layer below. Map plot layer below. Right. Okay. 
whether the python whether the python style is visible to you abraham no no it, it is not doctor i think you are sharing on a different screen or maybe you are sharing only ppt uh, you have to share your entire screen only the ppt is visible right now yes so all window yes so all so all window yeah whether the, the python uh, cell cell is visible to you still no um Can any Python? Uh, no. Python. Can anyone see it? No. Doctor, why don't you do this? Can you unshare yeah, and then? Whether the Python cell is visible now? Yes, it is visible. Yes. It yeah. Is. The image, image output. No. Only the shell is visible now. I think we can uh, share the whole desktop. That will be helpful instead of one window. Yes, I think. Share what screen entails. So Take there is the option of desktop one. Uh, 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 screen, the screen, uh, screen, screen means desktop screen. Yeah. So uh, when you share, uh, there will be. Uh, if uh, are you connected to multiple monitors, uh, multiple screens, or one screen only? Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Now, now the, the image is also visible. Now the image is also visible. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, close this image. Right. Our uh, here uh, the two axes are uh, written in a simple uh, in a single program. If I want to run the first program. Just I enter zero. Image read and display. Whether the image is visible? Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Again, if I want to run second program, operate the image. The second program program is pseudo color image. Is there a pseudo color image visible? Pseudo color image is visible. Whether the yes. 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 Okay, right. Now we go to another exercise. Some tenth uh, uh, exercise like that. Uh, so uh, I actually just had a question about pseudo color image. So what exactly is a pseudo color image? Sir, uh, is uh, uh, actually is just like that old original original color image like like, like that. But uh, just we are uh, 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 it's not exactly RGB image. It's actually like like that uh, original color image. And then the exercise number uh, some tenth image filtering. Uh, minimum filter output. Gaussian blur, blur output, filter output, median filter output, unshop mass filter output. And uh, we shall go to still image processing using open sip here the you know the image processing using open cv import cv2 just i am reading bad image here and i am going to display that original image here Whether the result is visible, bad image is visible to you? Yes. Yeah. We shall go to some other exercise to 
uh, right uh, image crop cropping like that exercise number 4 using open cv right uh, convert a color image into a grayscale image but and uh, stack uh, images in a single image window either using vertical stack or horizontal stack right uh, this one is the original image original image and uh, the grayscale image we are using vertical stacking the top one is the color image bottom is the grayscale image in horizontal stacking uh, stacking uh, the, the first one is color image and the second one is grayscale image like that we can add any number of images in horizontal or vertical in a single image window right this one is still image processing using open cv here we are going to uh, here i am going to show you some uh, uh, video processing using uh, what uh, uh, open cv import import uh, open cv using the command import cv to right capture using the web camera right this one has my image still image capture the yeah, frame from my uh, captured video and uh, another exercise some uh, some other exercises some exercise number 7 so uh, uh, converting a color image frame into grayscale image uh, the video name is bullfinch.mp4 yeah okay. uh, in this program i just uh, uh, open the video color video bullfinch.mp4 and convert that color video into gray uh, gray video and then gray video to binary video this after 20 seconds automatically it goes right if you want to open some other pro program let test some other Close the automatic tone for the twenty seconds. Open. This is access number fifteen. Uh, Video processing is using Open CV. Right. Just I am capturing a video and. Uh, i am uh, i'm do i'm i'm, I'm uh, just uh, doing classing blurring and uh, using by thrust i convert it into uh, uh, binary image and if i i'm going to find out the object tracking by using this algorithm This one is for uh, object tracking. 
the object tracking particularly useful to capture the face image uh, and uh, uh, and also for face detection particularly for face de face detection and uh, capturing of uh, eye nose and uh, ears ear features ear features ear features this one is for object object tracking so any other questions so all the programs already set to uh, abraham so if you want aunt i am going to post the github link in the chat all the still image and the video processing programs these are already uh, recorded in video format and posted as a video lecture in my youtube my youtube channel this one is the uh, um still uh, uh, the what are the uh, pro programs and exercise discussed in uh, in this talk uh, around 12 exercises using matplotlib and pillow and uh, around 6 exercises using still image processing uh, six exercises for still image processing using open cv and uh, 15 exercise uh, video processing using open cv right any other questions no i think um, uh, this is okay i mean um, i think the general consensus is that a little bit more polish will be required doctor in terms of uh, uh, an audience like pycon where people are uh, very intolerant I, i will i'll be honest there uh, and i think a um, little bit more polish will be required so the reason is one of the things we have these uh, one of the reasons we have these sessions before pycon is also to prepare uh, speakers um, or potential speakers for pycon so i okay. think um, uh, i i hope this feedback will be taken in good spirit that uh, you know um, it 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 does need to be a little bit more smoother and okay. um, uh, i feel like a good blend of uh, a code plus description will go a long way uh, okay. right, right now what is happening is i understand that uh, your intent is to have a set of uh, exercises and convey the respective results and then go to the code but i feel like people's attention span will reduce by the time you get to them and Uh, the actual meat of what you want to convey will be lost by the time you get to it right so okay. um, uh, i think that is something that uh, you can uh, definitely take back uh, i feel like there is a lot of content here and uh, i feel like the stitching should uh, be done a little bit better and i can uh, me and uh, ritesh and anirudh will definitely be able to help you there uh, okay so uh, th yes, thank sir. you so much for coming forward i mean uh, It, the first mark of a speaker is that he is willing to speak right and the, the, their uh, kudos thank you so much um, okay. but uh, the second phase is where uh, it, it gets a little bit more tricky and uh, we are definitely willing to help you that um, okay so thank you so much uh, is there anyone um, who has actually yeah. it was interrupted the flow was interrupted the uh, 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 laptop restart so definitely so I, i think i think a lot of things that could have gone right haven't but okay. uh, um, you know even despite all of that uh, i feel there is a, a little with a little bit more tuning i think it will be a lot more better for pycon so okay. uh, i will help you there right okay okay cool. thank, you. thank you doctor yeah. Uh, yeah and the links i think will be helpful for anyone who is beginning in image processing and they will be able to reference it from the github link so thank you so much for that uh, we'll definitely put it in the post notes session um yes uh, i think yeah 
Uh, before uh, we go to the next talk, right? That, so how this, this has been? Uh, I was just telling Anirudh and Ritesh that this has been one of our most improvised sessions so far, wherein uh, we did not have technical difficulties before, but now, despite them, we've had some people come up and you know talk about their experiences in image processing. And thank you so much for that. Um, I think those are topics that we will take up at some point in the future. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, Dr. Sendhil come back with another uh, talk as well at some point. Um, so uh, I think before we go to the next talk, the floor is open for around 10 minutes for anyone to talk about anything uh, in terms of what they've used, uh, done using Python, or even if there is something more germane to image processing, you can talk about it. I think Vinay did not get a chance to talk. Uh, he mentioned that he has some experience using Pillow. So uh, Vinay, if you remember, has uh, uh, presented a talk on Flask two meetups ago, and uh, it was one of our marathon talks. I, I don't think I've sat through one given, uh, let alone given one. So uh, Vinay, do you want to say something? Anyone? I, anyone want, want to question? Me? Yeah, before that, uh, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Sindhan? I suppose uh, there are no questions now, doctor, but if there are, uh, is there an email that they can reach you on? Uh, yeah. Share that. I think if you minimize this, it's there in the background, I think. Minimize this window. Okay, Sindhil Kumar. ECE, IRTT. At gmail.com. Rahul Venugopal, he posted some command related to pseudo coloring. We assign gray, gray, gray color scales to arbitrary color colors. Sometimes this can reveal some patterns that are not obvious in gray color. Okay. Yeah, I think that, that was more of an answer to someone who asked what pseudo coloring was. Uh, yeah. But I think, okay, any, I think we will move on in the interest of time. Uh, yeah, you, doctor, you can, you can uh, stop sharing now. Okay, uh, Alirod, uh, I try to use Jupyter notebook. Right, okay, for next time I'm on, For next time I'm on, on, on or PyCon in India, I try to use Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you with your sarcasm. Yeah, I, and uh, I, I definitely, uh, you know, I would uh, ask you to take these comments with the, you know, like uh, in the right spirit, right? I think everyone wants uh, a good show, right? And I think that is uh, that that is the expectation. So. I'm sure it will get better in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So Pavitra is here. But before that, does anyone have any? Is Vinay there? Oh, I think. Okay. Okay. One second. I think he's. Not here. I think we have some more uh, veteran speakers here as well. Rivas is here. Um, Rahul, I think you're going to be talking at some point. So do you want to say something about image processing? Yeah, go on. Uh, hi, Abhi. Hi, everyone. Right. Uh, I'm under, am I audible? Yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah, so happy to be. I was postponing attending this meeting meeting and luckily now I'm able to attend this. Thank you for that. So I'm a PhD student doing uh, neurosciences at uh, Nimhans the so-called mental hospital. So I'm a person who transferred my career from engineering to neuroscience, which are totally orthogonal. So, and I was surprised to realize that in neuroscience and especially in biological sciences, there is a hell lot of engineering, mathematics, programming, computing, and everything. <laughs> so that is one thing. Yeah, so I thought I'll quickly share a couple of things which I worked on during my master's. So first one was with respect to image segmentation. So we get uh, lots of microscopic images, which are basically, uh, we need to count the number of cells. 
and as you know there will be like say 1000 6000 8000 number of cells and they vary slightly in their cell shapes so manually doing it is very difficult for sure and generally we used to have proprietary software which used to come with the microscopes but again you know i mean my college was a government institute and uh, again funding issues so these projects were given to students as their mtech or masters or btech projects right so where we have to come up with algorithms using image segmentation all the pseudo coloring things and maybe i will not say machine learning but uh, linear models statistical models so that we can achieve the cell counting so that was one application which i briefly worked on second one was with respect to retinoscopic images so you can uh, put a fancy instrument in front of your eyeball and capture the image of your retina and it is known that people who are diabetic who are in their chronic stages later they can develop some issues with respect to their vision and before even showing up some clinical symptoms from a doctor and all it will be obvious in this retinoscopic images so you you get there are these data sets are publicly available so you get these images and try to get some classification normal abnormal maybe abnormal type of images so that was the second project with us involving image processing and those days we were uh, entire lab and our department were using matlab and later recently i migrated myself to python r and all so i realized like there are wonderful packages which could do things uh, literally with very much ease rather than struggling with the matlab environment so i think we have definitely a uh, lot many features and applications and open source code available so the third pass was a funny project we did this was from the cct footages we can detect the number plate and give access uh, for parking so it, uh, we had some pseudo code in place where Hello. Yeah, I think Abdi is on mute. Okay, yeah. Uh, but uh, you guys could hear me, right? I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. I... We could hear you. Quite interesting. Yeah, I Especially... think my network connection dropped for a few. <laughs> All right, man. The irony. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Quite interesting, especially the one about the uh, way that you can detect diabetes through a picture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's a pretty well-known thing, uh, the retinoscopic images and automatic image classification segmentation even same holds for the x-ray uh, for example recently in the covid situation so people were using uh, when especially you take the chest x-ray you can spot some minuscule patterns so but again it's not confirmatory i mean still people are uh, debating about it and research is ongoing so uh, x-ray is way cheap compared to mri or any other imaging so any person comes and it is very fast so do an x-ray within a within couple of minutes you can get diagnosis so that is one more direction where uh, people are moving ha huh. so i guess there is a question i think from sachin so those days i was working in matlab and i have some matlab codes maybe i'll uh, push it to git and uh, uh, will share the links with abhi so that we can get it later i think that cctv thing and cell counting thing we could uh, get some success so maybe i'll i'll share that code is very much uh, i mean Oh, what do you call weird commenting and uh, random variable names instead of a maybe this will work we had some funny <laughs> variable names like that so yeah we'll go there yeah we will be brutal in the pull request yeah sure <laughs> no i think i really appreciate that because i was so happy to see i think the previous comments when uh, we should criticize i think there is a thing in our lab uh, we should eat our lab mates in their uh, journal presentation so before somebody else criticize we should be very critical and uh criticize our own work so that we can patch those holes so that public phone criticize it so i was so happy to uh, see that comment definitely uh dev jyoti is asking can we detect early stages of diabetes using retinopathy yeah so this is what uh, so retinopathy is a broad field and whatever i talked about was a specific thing about diabetic retinopathy where the chronic diabetes can lead to vision impairments and other retinopathies so yes in retinoscopic and even in the fundus images uh, that is well known but again i think still that work is still limited to engineering projects it's 
uh, yet to get a wide uh, acclaim from the clinical community. So I think that bridge is uh, yet to be done. But I mean, very much it's a very promising area. Uh, yeah, I think um, we are on schedule to start. Uh, so Rahul, thank you so much. Huh? And no, no, uh, sure, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll wait for those links from you. Uh, ah, great. I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay. All right. Sure, okay. sure. Excellent. All right, guys. Yeah. Bye. And uh, I think maybe Rahul, you can also post your uh, email ID for huh. people to visit. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. I'll do that. Sure. All right. So, I think Pavitra is here. So, Pavitra, uh, thank you for um, you know, agreeing to present about uh, deep learning. 101 uh, using uh, with image processing in the mix. So please take it away. I think you'll describe this title better than I have. Hey, thanks, Abhiram. Uh, how is everyone? I hope everyone is safe. Uh, COVID is suddenly a crazy time to, you know, uh, it's been very extraordinary times to be here. So a uh, uh, quick introduction about myself. Uh, first of all, can you all hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, very clearly, yes. Awesome. So, uh, I'm Pavitra. I work as a staff data scientist in uh, Swiggy, and my expertise is in computer vision. So, earlier, like around 2015 or so, is when I started working in computer vision, and it was mainly in OpenCV and Python. And uh, we, I used to run an AI startup uh, along with another co founder. And we got actually hired by Swiggy last year, uh, 2019 Jan. And uh, the, the journey has been very interesting because when we started out, computer vision was not so hot. Uh, it was more about, we used to work on Octave or I used to work mostly on Python because it was a lot easier. Uh, and um, around 2016, I attempted to study deep learning and uh, there was a lot of math in it. And Andrew NG was my guru and it took at least three or four attempts to even finish the first course. So yeah, I, it, it was like very interesting, but at the same time quite daunting. Around 2017-18, I started working on uh, deep learning, uh, mainly working on... Um, so uh, our AI startup was about creating videos. It was about uh, how to help non-designers to help create videos. So we were working with some media companies to create this one minute kind of videos, right? Uh, where we just put together some images and then, uh, you know, text and do some uh, basic computer vision, understand uh, where you need to put the text, how you have to understand the image, semantically understanding the images, etc. And then later we moved on, we pivoted to sports analysis, wherein we were working with uh, sports clubs. And this is more about amateur, uh, you know, uh, sports. Like for example, in, in Bangalore, last few years, you would have seen that a lot of badminton uh, courts have mushroomed, right? Like, you, you don't have to be uh, PV Sindhu, but the thing is, you just want to see how good your backhand is and uh, or just want to see some of your rallies that you really played really well. Uh, you want to get highlights of your game. How do you do that? So we were looking at how can we use a single camera and use cam computer vision, uh, probably using edge inferencing and uh, use uh, post tracking and action recognition and see how else we can bring gameplay insights to badminton. We started with badminton because it is a lot easier. It's a racket sports and then there are only two people there in it. Uh, but the, essentially, our goal was to go to cricket. Uh, you know, I am not a cricket specialist, but the one thing is, uh, you know, cricket is, is far more suited for computer vision than any other game, like than football, right? Because there are a lot of things that you can get out of the statistics that you can get out of uh, uh, just a single shot. And we were looking at that. At the point of time, uh, you know, running a startup also has its own uh, uh, issues and we were also running out of steam. So there was this opportunity to join Swiggy and we joined. Uh, here in Swiggy, it's been pretty interesting because I was one of the first people in computer vision to join Swiggy here. And I have debated myself whether I'm a data scientist or not because I kind of envisioned myself or see myself as an engineer because, uh, you know, uh, DL, deep learning has a lot of engineering in it. It's, it's not just running a model, but it's also about, uh, you know, data preparation, getting your data, data abstraction, and then uh, you run your model, you have to get your architecture, what kind of a model you're going to run, uh, your loss functions, etc. And then comes the model deployment, because that's where, you know, you, you must have seen all these interesting blogs that come out saying, hey, look, uh, you can get started with uh, kind of convolutional neural networks in 15 minutes, and look, you can actually uh, identify cats from dogs. 
yes but the most important thing is also about taking a model to production uh, so the, the reason why i talked about this is that um, i came to know about your group like two days back from abhiram and um, i uh, ha this talk is going to be more conceptual i don't have any jupyter notebooks to show you but probably next time we can definitely deep dive uh, and probably talk about one architecture uh, could be object detection or segmentation etc that you might find more interesting so we could do that but i think uh, since people are also interested in knowing what's happening in you know, no real life experiences talking about projects i think we can also talk about that uh, how easy or difficult or what hampers what uh, helps uh, computer vision uh, image processing especially in uh, let's say uh, in real life use cases like how we do it in swiggy i can talk about uh, like few things like uh, what we have worked on in food tech food is especially a very difficult subject when it comes to computer vision because uh, you might not whether or no it's a tea or a coffee with just a picture or you might not know whether it's a paneer curry or a, a chicken gravy from a picture right because there is something called as occlusion basically you can just look at from the top what do you see right and uh, perceive from it so computer vision is a little difficult there but we were also looking at how well we could you know put it in uh, in in practice for example uh, one thing that we did was have you heard of uh, the bowl company it's i'm sure if you live in bangalore uh, you would know this uh, bowl company uh, they actually a private brand of swiggy and uh, yeah thanks adarara uh, so in bowl company what we did was it since it's uh, our own kitchens right uh, one thing is well, one of the major issues that was coming up is uh, you know when non veg goes in instead of vegetarian dishes right and it's a very sensitive topic in india and we want to take it uh, uh, you know seriously so what we did was um, we actually built a small rig okay it's a it's a rig where in rig basically means you know it's not a high fund thing it's basically a box where you put a camera we put a depth camera in it and then uh, you know it takes pictures of the bowl before it's being sent to the delivery executive that is once it leaves from the kitchen and it goes delivery executive between that we wanted to make some kind of an automated check and uh, we we did a very simple dish classification kind of a thing uh, and we also wanted to add the, let's say for example use depth camera to understand whether the portion is correctly on uh, correctly kept or not because that is one of the important things that is happening sometimes you know they would get 600 orders in 10 minutes and uh, everything there has to go per second like if you go to the sous chef i mean it's a very fancy way of calling the chef but uh, you know he's he's in charge of the kitchen right so you go to the sous chef and he says hey you know what you're going to put this rig is going to add another minute uh, to my uh, you know delivery i mean kitchen to you know delivery time and uh, we had to convince him saying that it is going to actually reduce your time for automated checks i mean whenever you're checking it they don't do automated checks they just check one in like some 10 dishes and then they send it across and then we said you know it's going to take 10 seconds and we had to put something called as a uh, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard the Nvidia. It's a it's a small Raspberry Pi with a GPU on top of it. It's a very small GPU, and we use that uh, because Raspberry Pi will not give you real time uh, predictions. So we use that along with a depth camera and RGB camera and everything. It was so fun, da. But when we go to the kitchens, right, we saw that they didn't have a three pin plug point. So <laughs> it was a very interesting journey wherein it's all about bringing everything together. and it's not just computer vision it's also about how you bring uh, your engineering problem solving into it and also how you find optimal solution for it so this is one of the projects that we have done in swiggy uh, but unfortunately because of covid and everything uh, you know everything has taken a back seat uh, because yeah i mean probably another 2 3 months when um, things i mean i'm not going to say things get normal but at least when we are going to be more normal about covid and we have all the practices proper practices in place probably this project will get kick started again so uh, that's a that's a project that we had worked on but what i wanted to talk today about was more about deep learning and uh, it's like i'm not going to show you another one python code in kera saying that put this layer put this layer run this uh, you know model tada okay results are out this this talk is more about the intuition behind it uh, i can i was just uh, hearing what uh, rahul was saying um and uh, it's very interesting working in neuroscience 
so rahul uh, i might be taking a couple of ideas uh, from neuroscience to just show it but uh, feel free to add more points to it because we are all completely newbies here just taking his ideas just to you know uh, so that we we build up to the idea of what a neural network is so uh, any anyway, much about nothing uh, let's get started abhiram can i share my screen yeah pavitra please go ahead Okay, so I know this uh, deep learning is this uh, kind of topic that everyone talks about. They're like, you know what? This is all I know. This is all I know. I mean, this uh, I just saw this Andrew and his video and all. I know people who have seen videos for ten minutes and then come and talk about it. So this is more about actually going, you know, under the cover of deep learning and uh, understand the intuition behind it, right? So what I'm going to do is let's start with a quiz, right? Um, what you could do is you could uh, keep your uh, like a there's a buzzer here so probably you can put it in the chat so this is the quiz right so i'm going to show you two faces for two seconds and you have to say which face is real and which face is fake and in this case just say which one is fake whether it's the left side or the right side face so basically your answer should be a left or right okay so let me go over it again i'm going to show you two faces two seconds and that's all you take and then you make a judgment call which one is it which one is fake is it the left one or the right one here we go which is fake okay i can't see the uh... what left i mean are the images even there no is this that's why i said it's going to be 2 seconds okay so in this case the left one was fake okay so okay this is trial round uh I'm again going to show you two faces, and it's going to disappear in two seconds. Take a call within two seconds. All right. Which one, left or right? Okay, fine. It was the right. It was the fake one. The left was original. Again, two seconds. Left or right? Okay. The right one was fake. We go for the fourth one. Ready? Which one, left or right? Yeah, left one. This one is a little easy. Left one was fake. Which one? Okay. I think it was the right one. Yes. Okay. So what exactly happened here? So basically, what I what this happened here was that these people do not exist. Uh, you can check it out in this website called this person does not exist dot com. Uh, this is generated by something called as a GAN. Uh, it's it's. Uh, it's it's called a generative adversarial networks uh, you know it's a fancy name and all we'll just crack it because i'm sure you've heard about gans and deep fakes and everything but what i wanted to start out was with uh, you know understanding gans uh, it's just the intuition behind it is just a logic behind it i'm not going to show you any code so it's also about i have seen that uh, you know people do this that um, you know i go for some of these meetups ai meetups and then they are like do gans man they are the real thing you know this week i was usual man i was just training this gan and uh, oh you heard that one that creates picasso paintings and all by the way this also helps as a pickup line uh, i have not tried it a couple of my friends have they said it's it's a pretty good pickup line saying talking about gans so anyhow let's talk about gans here okay so before i start talking about gans right i wanted to start with a story okay so it's sort of like a uh telugu tamil movie story or okay bollywood movie story okay so what happens is there are two friends okay and uh, there is this one guy who is really hard working and uh, somehow because of ill luck or anything he seems to uh, not be successful in life but he is this kind of a guy who can get anything done and then there is this um, other guy who is let's say he is smart and somehow he got a good job and right now he is let's say working in a place like rbi okay now no this is completely hypothetical so you know just take this with a huge pinch of salt so anyhow so there is this person uh, who is um, you know he is working in rbi these guys are meeting after like say 15 20 years and they are sitting in a bar and then this guy friend a who is uh, 
not got any job properly or anything he starts saying dude you know i can do anything in the world possible but it is that i never got an opportunity and then this rbi friend guy he is like you know he's a little pissed off with his manager i guess i don't know what's happened there so he is like dude really uh if that's the case then um, can you forge a new currency that's going to come out and this guy is like uh, okay i can give it a shot and uh, this uh, rbi friend guy is like you know then he gives a kind of a bollywood kind of a twist say but you should stay in a remote island and uh, you should do this you know without anyone's help you should not see in the internet anything uh, and the most important thing the most important condition here is you are not going to see the currency you are going to create a uh, fakes of the currency and going to show it to me and i'm going to give you feedback and say whether it's a real or a fake one so this is how it goes right we have this friend who's a forger and then we have this bank official who's a friend b and uh, he is the one who has actually seen the real currency notes right the new one that's going to come up so what this forger does is he's like okay fine i just create something uh, let's say some uh, 2500 rupees note okay and then he is like he creates some kind of a note and then he draws something whatever he knows or something or a sort and then he shows it to the bank official and this guy says whether it's real or fake right and he also gives some feedback saying hey this is not uh, the real one and this is how it should look like probably you know here and there yeah, you should change these these things and this iteration goes on and on and on and one point of time the forger is able to create a currency note that the bank official thinks that it is real so he is able to fool the bank official right because that was a challenge he had to fool him and uh, this is exactly what happens in a gan okay there are two networks here one is called as a generator network the other one is called as a discriminator network so what this generator network does is it doesn't know uh, what it has to generate okay it just generates noise like it can just generate some thing like okay fine some some image some something like not even an image right whatever uh, so image is basically a matrix so basically it puts together some matrix and sends it across to the discriminator now the discriminator in this case uh, let's say for example the person this does not exist case right he this discriminator uh, he or she has seen this network has actually seen human faces right and it knows what human faces are so he looks at the output of the generator and goes saying okay this is real this is fake and it gives some kind of a feedback and this iteration goes on and on and on and the generator becomes as good as generating an image the discriminator is not able to say whether it's a real human face or not and in that process we get these kind of image that you saw like in the previous slides wherein these people don't exist it's just an image that was created by a gan and that's where all this interesting deep fakes and everything comes across but this is basically the crux of it and then this in different flavors and in different forms we have different gan networks and different things that can do you know uh, for example not just images we can also generate uh, text voice speech etc but this is a very interesting topic that um, you know i thought probably you know uh, presented because gans are like people just think okay gans are something big like but there's a very interesting thing right it's kind of this uh, game that a generator and discriminator play and then the generator learns by the feedback that is given by the discriminator right so just to give you a uh, example of how a gan works right so this is from nvidia uh, they did the uh, hyper realistic um, headshots and uh, the images the faces will look really beautiful because it is from a data set called as celebrity 1 million data set so basically all the hollywood actors and actresses and uh, so what they do is they start with some six images and they start with noise basically right so here in this case the noise is in the form of some skin color pixels so you can see these pixels right so it's like some four cross four pixels or four cross four pixels uh, for each image and uh, then they start training so this is how it goes but you can see right even when these gans are this when they are training a gan the images are not perfect so if you see to the left that person specs right it's all looking wobbly but anyway they actually concentrated on this person because within 11 days right they're able to get a high res picture of a person which is 1024 plus 1024 and not only that you can keep changing the styles you can keep changing the gender color etc so it is a very interesting thing that i wanted to share because this is uh, how it all started because you know in 2012 it started with probably identifying cats and dogs and we are here 8 years later 
well able to do this right so that that's that's uh, that's about deep learning but deep learning is also not just about you know magic and stuff because there's a lot of logic involved in it so um, here is where i want to explain how it all started like how did they all bring this idea together so they did this something called as a board cat and monkey experiment and uh, rahul you can pitch in if you want here but this is just more to understand how neuroscience helped in uh, you know creating or you know uh, putting together the first neural network okay so what they did was this they got two board cats and one monkey uh, the black cat right basically they didn't use it uh, it was just like for some he was interested and he just came in i guess anyhow we have a monkey and a cat here so the first thing starts with the monkey right so what they did was okay this was a little uh, gruesome so anyhow uh, they showed this monkey the picture to the left right so basically it's something like a black screen and then they have some lights across it right and they injected the monkey with a glucose kind of a, 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 a substance and uh, what they did was they when the monkey was looking at it for like 25 30 minutes and it was like you know held in position and looked at they did something really really gross they chopped off the monkey's head and then they you know take the tissues out and they did a lot of their sciency stuff neuroscience stuff and then they figured out how an image forms on your brain so right now i'm looking at you or you're looking at the screen and right now the brain right like uh, right from your eyes that goes to your brain it's actually creating a visual mapping of what you're seeing across your brain so that was one of the main things that they actually learned from this experiment it's called as retinotopic mapping uh, the next thing that they did was they had this uh, other board cat right but this time they were not this gross they were not very gruesome so what they did was they stuck electrodes to the uh, the cat's brain and they did something very interesting so they showed something called as a light stimuli right so basically like a bar of light and then they keep changing the direction of the light so the light could be like uh, uh, you know horizontal vertical uh, and then you know it could be to the slightly to the 45 degrees 60 degree etc the most important thing that they found here was as and when the light stimuli changed some of the neurons in the cat's brain fired up that is whenever it saw a vertical uh, line it fired up some neuron was firing up whenever it saw a horizontal line some of the neuron was firing up right so one thing that they saw that was by showing different edges by doing showing different kind of patterns there were some parts of the brain that are was like some parts of the uh, neuron that was you know you could you could see that uh, was getting fired up right so just putting these two neuroscience experiments together uh, there are two things that uh, we could learn right one is that we know how uh, images formed in a brain the second thing is your brain understands images through edges right for example uh, this is so obvious right you're looking at a house this happens i mean actually your brain actually was able to do it in i don't know nanoseconds or something but essentially what happens is we look at edges here you're looking at okay i see a lot of lines cross crossing okay that looks like a window uh, and then i can see some kind of a 3d projection okay the window comes out and then there is some kind of a you know a roof kind of a thing structure here again some lines and outlines and the basic the magic word here is edges this is where the most important uh, you know feature of computer vision started they were like okay we understand an image through edges right so two things that we know we know or now understand how the image forms in our brain and uh, from what we see that is and how our brain understands images from the edges in it right and they all said okay fine for example how do i understand nine right uh, okay there is a small zero there and then there is another one more line here add it together it's nine for eight okay two zeros put it together i get a eight so you basically learn from patterns you basically learn from the smaller patterns called as features or in our cases we can say edges right even four it's basically like three lines put together you get a four but it's also about how you're putting it together right so what happened was they got all, all this information and then the guy said let's all put everything together why don't we use this for creating a image processing kind of a network in which we we can we can make a machine understand an image so they said okay we have neurons in our brain why don't we put neurons in one layer so basically in our brain there are layers of neurons so they said like okay fine one neuron 
which basically understands a, a different edge like for example this neuron understands this kind of an edge this neuron understands this kind of a circle a c or some kind of a thing right so we basically put all these neurons together in one layer and we put lot of layers together and let's try to you know uh, make a neural network and see how it actually learns right so this is how the whole idea spark they looked at how our brain works and then they took that structure and used it but not necessarily how the brain learns it the learning part of it is what we're going to do later on but they were like let's use this kind of a structure to see if we can understand images right but the most important thing the next question is how do you find these edges okay i have this neuron uh okay uh, fine you're saying that we'll put it in a layer and all okay i got it you're saying it with edges and outlines i can understand images basically breaking down into smaller pieces and understand them but how a machine how can an algorithm understand what's kind of what kind of edges that or uh, how can you learn from these edges from a image right okay so this is how a image looks i'm sure you guys all know that uh so you basically have it's it's basically a black and white image uh your zero is your uh, uh white and uh, uh as and when it goes to the panel is going to 25 to 55 it's it's black and gets darker black and you know, darker gray that is and black etc so basically this is how your image looks right uh i'm sure you know a little bit of this but i just wanted to cover it as a as a as a basic concept right so here in this case right if you see uh again you see a very pixelated uh, a, a person's face a pixelated uh, face of a person and uh, one thing i just wanted to show is that uh each pixel corresponds to a value so it could be like something like i'm just going to run across the, if you see the small red box there so it just shows you the different kind of colors like for example when it is uh, lighter lighter white or lighter gray then the value will be lesser but if it's going to be a little darker especially when it comes to hair etc you're going to have something like some kind of a, a a black color pixel there right something that's closer to 255 okay so okay now that we know that this is how it is going to do a little bit of math here how do we find these edges we use some kind of a operation called as convolution so convolution has been around for quite some time now uh, convolution uh, is something that basically what you do is uh, you take a input matrix you take some kind of a smaller matrix called as a filter and then you apply this filter on top of this input matrix like you just slide across it and then you get an output okay i just give you like a very textbook definition of what convolution is but basically a convolution what it does is it does some sort of a image processing operation there are this uh, this filter is called as a kernel so there are these different types of filters and kernels that are available so let's say for example i want to uh, sharpen a image right uh, then i'll apply one type of a kernel across the image and i get an output for example i want to blur a image again i'll across uh, i'll get a kernel and then i'll put this put it across it when i'm saying kernel is basically under the matrix right and when i'm saying talking about matrices the next question comes what is the value of these matrices so let's just have a look at it right so this is how your convolution works so you just have this filter f and then you put it on input x and basically your output is is going to be the addition of the all the all the four values and uh, if this this is a three cross three matrix this is what you find in uh, four uh, five cross five matrix right so this is the output that you get so this is just to show how a convolution works and in this case i'm just going to show you like how the convolution actually works so what you are seeing here the 0 minus 1 0 minus 1 5 minus 1 this matrix this matrix is a kernel and this kernel helps in sharpening an image that's exactly what is done here right so they take this sharpen a kernel and then they apply it over if you see the red uh, boxes that go over there right so basically you go over the image like this and then you multiply it and then you get an output so if you see to the right it's basically a sharpened image a sharpened image is basically wherein uh, you look at the contrast increases let's say for example you want to blur it right as a matter of fact blurring i'm sure most of you know it's basically taking average of the pixels around it right and that's what exactly this kernel does it just take an average of the pixels around it and it gives you a kind of a blurred image so kernels have been around for quite some time now um so let's say for example you have different types of kernels like sharpening you have a kernel for laplacian you have a kernel uh, sobel x gives you all your uh, 
you know, vertical edges. Sobel Y gives you all your horizontal edges. Uh, emboss gives you, uh, brings you different kind of things where, you know, uh, bring out the edges a little bit more, like as a embossing effect. So the thing is, earlier what people used to do is, whenever they want to do some kind of an image processing operation, they will be like, okay, I need to get these values of these matrices right. So they will be like, they'll just take a pen and paper or, you know, just probably write a photon program or something of that sort. And then they figure this out saying, okay, fine. These are the values that we need to use for this kernel and uh, get this output out, right? But we are going to use this convolution, convolutional kernels for something called as feature extraction, right? Uh, in this case, when I keep when I'm talking about features, it's basically understanding the smaller features, the edges, right? So we're going to use convolution operation to get these edges. So, you know, this is a very, very simple neural network. Uh, this is, uh, there is this data set called as MNIST. MNIST is like kind of a hello world for deep learning. And if you just want to get started, right, you just take this MNIST and then it's basically like a, a 50,000 images of handwritten digits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So given a handwritten digit, you have to figure out which number it is. And here in this case, right, what I've done is what basically bringing all the ideas together, each neuron is basically considered that as a convolutional color. And you're going to put all these neurons together in one layer. And then you're going to have a few more layers of it. And then you're going to run through it. You're going to keep extracting information from one layer onto another layer and onto another layer. And in the last layer, you get some sort of an information with that. You create some kind of a probability or you do some sort of a learning algorithm there and then say, okay, with this information, I think the number that you've written is four or it's eight, etc. right? So let me just show you a quick thing. So I'm writing four, right? So when I write four, you, what you basically see here is the convolution layers. And uh, in every convolution layer, what you're seeing is actually the features that are being extracted out of it. I know this is a little abstract. I'm just trying to put everything together here. Like this is how actually a convolution neural network looks like. And this is how we can visualize the output of each layer. And this is a very interesting thing to have a look at it because what we do is we just uh, learn it like as if it's like a syntax, like saying, you know what, ah, okay, I'm, I understand, okay, uh, how to understand images, we need to get edges, uh, for edges, we're going to use convolutional kernels. Okay, uh, we also understand from neuroscience that this is the kind of a structure we want. We're going to put a lot of these kernels together and create one layer, and another layer, and another layer. Yes, but this is how it actually looks like, right? So now we understand the structure. We also know what we're going to do, but here comes the most important part, right? Uh, how are we going to learn these features, right? How does it actually learn these features or these edges, right? So, uh, of course, I'm sure everyone knows this. Neural network has a lot of layers in it, but what do these layers do? How do these layers understand a picture? Okay, now we have edges. I found these edges. The next layer would be like, for example, putting these things together and like, okay, I'm able to see something like a shape or a blob of shape here. Okay, this looks like a wheel, you know, and then you put things together. Okay, this looks like a door. Okay, uh, I'm, and then the next layer, another bunch of layers would be like, okay, I can see like four, four uh, you know, three wheels and I can see some two or three doors. I look some kind of a hatchback that's there. Okay, what I'm looking at is basically a car, right? So this is exactly how our brain looks at it, but we have a structure that is similar to brain, but you're gonna make that structure learn. But how does it even learn? So basically in lower level features, it's more about understanding this edges, etc. Okay, I find a left side edge, I find this line here, etc. So that's what I wanna quickly show you on how a neural network looks like. This is how a neural network looks like, or the, this is the output of a neural network, which is cross-sectioned across, let's say some uh, first 10 layers, next 10 layers, and next 10 layers, right? So this is a car. The first thing that you see is the low-level feature like, uh, sorry, uh, you, you can see a low-level feature like, okay, fine, there is a, there is a, so there's a wheel here, there is a, a door here, etc. right? So, so have a look at it, right? So this is what you basically are saying. Lower level features, you have a right edge or a left edge, and then you make it, you are, you put everything together, you get some shapes of blobs, and then you have some higher level features like, okay, when I'm looking at a face, like probably, yeah, I can see an eye, I can see a nose, I can see a, a mouth, I'm putting, going to put together and say, okay, fine, this is a face. So a uh, layer one of yours will basically understand features like, you know, edges like this. And your layer two will start to understand something like, 
if you see your green and the the orange boxes here right you start understanding that okay i am seeing a circular pattern here i am seeing some kind of a right edge here or some kind of a 90 degree uh, right edge here and then as we move on it starts to make sense it starts to look at bigger uh, the bigger picture like okay fine i am able to see finer aspects of a car of a car's tire here uh, are able to understand that this is a honeycomb pattern when it's when you look at the green color box or you're able to understand the imprint of text like say okay this is looks like a text here or a person's face or like looks like a person is standing and as and when we go across right like for example uh, for identifying dogs one of the most important features that they look at is the snout of a dog and uh, with that snout of a dog is how they even identify whether it's a pug or whether it's this uh, you know uh, pomeranian etc right so you all put these things together and then you know you get far more interesting features and with these features we learn what kind of an image it is and when i'm going to say learn it's more the more about how are these how are we learning here okay i get it they are extracting features here they are finding some sort of a patterns here now we're going to put these patterns together but how does a neural network actually learn here right so here again i just wanted to give you an analogy of uh, let's say uh, your grandma right she makes this amazing samba right and uh, let's say um, your grandma has passed away and your mom and dad rave about it they are like oh that samba was amazing you know what what grandma means to do and you are like had enough of it and you are like you know what i am going to give it a shot right and you are like making up a taking up an assignment saying okay ten attempts to recreate my grandma samba okay my grandma samba pulusu whichever it is or uh, kadi or whatever it is so, so grim pavitra <laughs> you just introduced the grandma and she killed her already <laughs> Uh, oh okay fine listen grandma's a very sweet and all uh i i this is a hey, hypothetical come on we are talking about uh, currency notes so this is also hypothetical so it's not very grim i mean it's neural networks and stuff and uh, anyway i think uh, oh yeah now you're just got down the mood okay india <laughs> so you know i got too many questions in this analogy and then no please I, go on. i'm sorry yeah please no, 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 sure. i know the thing is this i thought okay let's just kill the grandma because someone told me that why can't we go directly go ask the grandma the recipe and this was a kid this is 10 year old kid and i was like i couldn't answer the kid i was like okay let's kill the grandma simple so anyhow sweet old grandma making amazing sambar we can eat that sambar and you're going to recreate that sambar recipe etc so what you do is okay uh, you're going to create this uh, okay when i say soup because okay all these pictures are a little western because uh, i couldn't get free icons of indian faces uh the the mom and dad they actually look at western parents they are indian parents okay just a side note there so anyhow uh, what i do is you make some sort of a sambar and if it's me what i would do is put some hot water uh probably put some sambar powder and then yeah i know i'm horrible for so and then put some vegetables in it and then i'm going present to my parents and say they are like excuse me you missed out the tamarind and most importantly you missed out the salt so basically what i'm going to do is i'm going to keep attempting to you know recreate my grandma's legendary sambar and i'm going to get feedback from my mom and dad right and probably in my 10th attempt you know first attempt they said okay tamarind and then the second attempt they'll be like you know yeah i get it tamarind is too much probably put this sambar powder or make this your own kind of a sambar powder or you know uh, put some spices in it uh, what is deeper in sambar yeah put some turmeric put some salt and then um, uh, and then i figure out that i need a pressure cooker actually and then i go get a pressure cooker or something so basically i'm going to you know get feedback from my mom and dad and i'm going to keep attempting it and the whole point of me learning is that i have a reference point that is my grandma's legendary sambar and my sambar has to get there right so this is exactly what happens this is what we call in a neural network as called as a loss function okay what we do is we try to minimize this loss function so that we also learn and minimize this loss function and such that your output is almost similar to that you need to get right and it's something like uh, let's say uh, you get let's say uh, 40 marks in math exam and then you want to get 95 hey indian parents right and what do you do your loss function is 95 minus 40 55 marks you have to kind of bridge because 95 is average in indian style right so anyhow you want to get average marks so you want to get to the 55 right so basically what you do okay fine i'll take up calculus and i'll learn i'll do this slowly you start improving and then you get 60 you get 70 
but basically you are improving as and when your loss function that is your mark also reduces right and you know that you're improving only when your loss function also reduces wherein you're improving your marks right so this is a very very important concept in neural network because without a loss function right you have to define a loss function for a machine to learn basically you're saying that you know this is how you bridge it okay so putting it all together uh, if you're going to make your uh, grandma samba uh, your input would be your uh, probably uh, tamarind vegetables spices samba powder turmeric chili powder all these things right i'm sure i'm missing out onions and tomatoes thanks i completely forgot so onions and tomatoes see that was probably in the ninth attempt i figured out so you put all these inputs together and what actually happens is you make some you just go through this whole network right in the sense of neural network and then you bring out some output and then you minus that from your grandma samba your loss function and then you also take feedback from your parents now this is a very important point what actually happens in a neural network so how do these neurons learn right now we understand there is a loss function but how do this like let's say i have this layer 1 2 3 and 4 right uh, layer 4 understands the loss function here but how does layer 4 teach layer 3 that you have to change these things right so this is where a very interesting concept called as back propagation works okay back propagation is a lot of math i am not getting into it but if you guys are interested we'll do it later on we can do a kind of a numpy you know based on it we can create a neural network and see how it back propagates etc it's very interesting because once you figure out back propagation right that's when you actually learn your network so basically what happens is you back propagate the loss to the first layer such that the layer learns okay i'm kind of abstracting things here but i just want you to understand the concept that you have a loss function and then you have this uh, new neural network and this neural network layers learn according to the loss function that is calculated at the end right so that you come closer and closer you minimize the loss function and you have a neural network that is able to generate an output that is close enough to the output that you want so that's exactly what a neural network how a neural network works right okay so this is a loss function i just wanted to scare you guys and uh, this is a loss function for um, i'm sure you have heard about this network called as yolo right yolo is this object detection and it really uh, uh, the thing is yolo is a game changer like the person i forgot his name but uh, the when he brought out this network is like people are like amazed they're like oh wow object detection can run this fast right uh, it also came with a video of mission impossible or something Uh, some action movie uh, which uh, my my husband watches so basically some action movie and uh, it was able to detect so many uh, objects in such a real time so this is actually a loss function but don't get scared it's actually a loss function that we can also kind of figure out uh, in some terms a uh, loss function can also be very simple like this you have a y value that you want to go to like let's say it's a prediction like 1 or 0 right and your prediction is a 0 but the the real value is 1 So you have to take a zero to one, right? So this is just like a RM, uh, you know, root mean squared kind of or a mean squared kind of a, a loss function uh, you can use. So loss functions are of different types. So th this is a very important thing. But only when you design your loss function is how you design your learning, right? So uh, I think we're not putting all these things together. But now I just talked about only one layer, which is a convolution layer. Uh, so convolution layer doing convolutions is that all? No. So the i'm going to introduce another layer also here it's called as a uh, uh, pooling layer but before that right this is a very interesting uh, thing that i wanted to note so when i'm saying a convolution so basically if you see that uh, purple or violet i don't know whatever color it is so basically you have this color and it goes on top of this matrix and then you get an output and again you do a convolution on that yellow color matrix you get another output which is the green color right so this green daba is basically the receptive field of that matrix what i'm trying to say is this phi cross phi matrix i have extracted the information from it and it's there in this green pixel so the number that the green pixel basically says is the num is the information that i got from this so basically what happens in a convolutional neural network is you you keep extracting information and then you do something called as sampling that is you also reduce the size of it like uh, like for example you know filtering it out like okay fine uh, i'll just take some of this important information Like I don't have a bottleneck, and say, okay, fine. I have all this information. Now reduce it 
you get the most important information. Now again, do some lot of convolutions. Again, reduce it. Again, do a lot of convolutions. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the most important information from an image, keep bubbling up to the top, and then use that as a you know input to the loss function and learn from it, right? So this is what is something called as a max pooling layer. So a max pooling layer is basically a very simple layer. What it does is it looks at a three cross three or a two cross two matrix and says, what is the highest number that I see? And I take that, all right? So if you see here, what you do is you do convolutions. Then I'm saying subsampling is basically a max pooling. Then you do convolutions, then you do a max pooling. Then you do, there's another layer called as basically putting everything together. It's basically like, a, you know, you stretch it out uh, and uh, you have a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, flatten off, uh, numpy dot flatten off, right? So basically you have everything in a single dimension vector. And from there, you actually do some kind of a loss function, basically take all the values or something of it, whichever you want to do, whichever your architecture is. We don't have to worry about that, but this is how it is. Like, uh, as a matter of fact, right, uh, I don't know, it's a thing that, uh, I, I don't cook or anything, but a friend of mine, right, he actually likes chapati a lot and he, he always does his dough and all really well. He gives me a lot of tips. And once he told me, you know, it's like, uh, you know, making the chapati batter. Like you press and then you stretch and then you like, I was like, okay, funny, but yeah, I get it. Uh, so a neural network is something like that. You basically, you learn a lot and then you compress it. And then you learn a lot and you compress it. Basically, you keep bubbling up the more important information from an image, which is basically your features and you keep learning from it. And when you are talking about these features, just going back to the older topic, right? Where in first we just learned all the edges and then we were able to make the circles and then you're able to actually make some uh, features like the snout of a dog, where it's a little difficult. Like you have a dog and then you have a face of the dog, etc. So you learn higher level features, right? So yeah, uh, again, coming back to the same topic, your eight, the, the bottom most part is your input. Then you have a convolution layer. Then what you do is basically subsample it, which is a max pooling. And then again, you convolve, subsample it, and then you kind of flatten it out. And then you have another layer called the fully convolution layer. Basically, that just multiplies with another one more matrix and brings it down to whichever number you want. So basically like a probability kind of a score. So here in this case, my probability score would be like uh, 0 0.8 for uh, a, number eight, 0 0.1 for number zero, or 0 0.02 for number three or something of that sort. So it's more about probably when I'm starting out my eight, my neural network say it's a six. The probability is 0 0.9 for six. So my loss function would be like, dude, you have to bring the 0 0.9 to almost zero and uh, this eight ka probability increase it, right? And it back propagates, you learn, and then again you do it, and then it keeps going on, right? So this is again our convolution neural network. Uh, you know, the, it's just try and it's a very simple convolution neural network. So yeah, uh, quickly, uh, last minute, I just wanted to show how does a neural network learn properly? Uh, there's something called as a grad cam. Probably we can do this later if you're interested. So basically we can see where does a neural network look at? Then it says, I want to identify this beagle, right? So it says that, fine, it's kind of a heat map kind of a structure that it gives and says, I was talking about the snout of the dog. It looks at the snout of the dog, it gives more weightage to it and says, okay, fine, this is a beagle. Or I'm saying this picture, a, a, a ball in the ground to the left, and it finds where the ball is. And then we say, okay, fine, there's a ball and it's able to identify the neural network, neural network is able to see where the ball is, right? So this is a very interesting thing called as grad cam. Uh, this is also one of the reasons why I bring it in because uh, people think deep learning is a black box. It is to some extent, but with things like grad cam and everything, computer vision becomes a little bit easier to kind of debug your network, saying that okay, uh, is it actually looking at the place where I want to look at, right? So for MNIST, this is going to be your like kind of a grad cam kind of a thing. So I think I've uh, not able to see the time here. Uh, going to take, take a quick time check. Are we on, are we on time? Yes, it's your time. You can. Okay, fine. So I think uh, we have some more time here. What I could do is uh, uh, we can we can discuss more about the work that I do in Swiggy also, because uh, uh, I mainly work on Python too. But probably uh, we, we can I could answer some of your questions uh, because I think uh, we've covered most of the topics of what a neural network does, and hopefully I was not too fast. So questions, I wanted to open up for a question and answer session. I mean, uh, despite the fact that this was the Raval Pindi Express, it, it's still pretty <laughs> informative. I, I definitely learned a lot. Okay, and um, I, I started off with no 
knowledge and it it was still pretty informative okay uh, and it was actually jogging a lot of the image processing class i had in like uh, post grad right so that time i didn't pay much attention but now in a practical sense all of these like um, sonam stock first and now your talk is uh, what uh, is jogging everything to the front of my mind and i think uh, you know people will definitely you know uh, benefit from uh, looking at the code with this first thing in mind right this is very required to place these uh, concepts in mind you pointed that out very rightly that uh, without this in mind if you just look at keras code or tensorflow code people will be like what is going on right like they will be happy to see code but i don't think there will be any value from it, right so i think this is definitely a lot more beneficial to set the stage than anything else that you could have done and uh, sachin is asking could you please talk about how to productionize a model in swiggy i don't know if that's proprietary or if that is uh, anything that you can oh, talk can about can i talk about it uh, okay or i will be express okay i really don't know about the food that's there okay let's talk about productionizing models that's actually a very good question so the thing is this um uh okay um let's talk about ml models because uh, not just cd models right uh, so here in this case uh, in, in 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 swiggy or any of most of these uh, uh places right when you have a well defined data science team they also have two types of teams called as a data platform team and there's another team called as a data science platform team okay so the data platform team takes care of your uh, tables your streams uh, uh, how many times you are refreshing your tables etc and uh, i'm not sure how many people know machine learning but we are talking about features here right in machine learning what you do is with structured data uh, you might also have to use some kind of a real time feature so for example a uh, real time feature for a person uh, you, when you're looking at your swiggy app and when you're saying okay when you place an order right and then it gives you an eta uh, that eta is actually a model and it's not just a model it's an ensemble of models and there are at least 10 models running and that gets gives you an output let's say within like 10 milliseconds uh, please do not even think about computer vision models giving in 10 milliseconds uh, probably if you have very very uh, you know super powerful gpu i'm talking about structured data and ml models which are slightly less heavier than uh, cd models so basically what happens is the real time feature here would be uh, your uh, uh, traffic conditions uh, uh, the the time that it's going to take for the delivery person to reach your kitchen and from the kitchen or from the restaurant to your house uh and then there are could be some more conditions like is it raining right so those kind of real time features come into the picture and also there could be some other features that are not real time that you have to pick up from your tables so data platform team takes care of all these things all this infrastructure around your tables um then you have your data science team uh, which i'm not going to talk about much they train the models uh, you do in ml you do something called as feature engineering basically what you do is you kind of hand pick the features and say these are the features i'm going to use but in computer vision the features are generated by our convolution layers so they are the feature extractors so we don't have to worry about features here so basically they do that uh, they use a algorithm called as gbt uh, which is called as gradient boosting trees and then what you do is we put this models let's say uh, how do we productionize them right so there are different ways to do it uh, my team in dsp feels that python is very slow so <laughs> they based it on jvm um so basically it's uh, most of the code is written in a language called as scala they use uh, something called as pyspark uh, let's say that is used for another kind of your in infra kind of handling your clusters etc right and then uh, what they do is they take this and they actually host it like with the api and everything so it's is basically a jvm that's running and then that's giving you an output so you have your feature stores etc so it's again a quite complicated uh, architecture and you can uh okay so the thing is um, it's mostly about how do you um it's more about how do you uh, deploy a model and uh, you're able to get real time features and also produce results within less than 10 milliseconds and productionizing models are very very difficult uh it depends like for example it depends on what kind of a dsp architecture your team is going to choose uh so for example these models these kind of architectures will not be able to support they can support tensorflow yes but they can't support pytorch okay and uh, because the thing is it's also about what kind of a thing that you have onboarded so we onboarded something called as a tensorflow serving and we use tensorflow serving and then they have done some kind of a manipulation around it optimization 
for example, in TensorFlow, we are doing a CPU inferencing. We also need to look at the CPU of the um, machine language set, right? That if you remember your computer science, like, you know, architecture and all. So basically, what kind of uh, architecture that does your CPU use? And you can also build a TensorFlow library based on that. And if it's going to be CUDA, it's going to be GPU. There are other ways to also optimize your models or make it even faster. And the uh, most important way of doing it is if, let's say, for example, you don't have an architecture that doesn't, uh, let's say, a PyTorch kind of a model, if you're not able to serve, what you do is you use Dockers. And Dockers are our best friends, right? Uh, Docker is basically containerization. So in this case, what we have done is from my, uh, yes. Okay. So hey, okay, something happened. Okay, so this is uh, Trey unmute, I think. Uh, sorry. Oh, okay, no issues. So, um, Dockerization also helps, but the thing is with Docker's, and the thing is that it's another layer, right? So, basically, there's going to be more communication and that, and that's why they are like my team feels that Docker might increase the uh, inferencing time. But that's the whole point. Like in computer vision models, anywhere you're inferencing time on a CPU is going to be, let's say, 100 to 200 milliseconds. And this is just a ballpark, right? If you're doing, let's say, segmentation kind of a work, etc., this is just object detection. If you're going to segmentation, or if you're going to look at video streams, etc., right? Uh, then it will going to take much more time than if you're just going to do CPU inferencing. When I'm saying in CPU inferencing, you basically run the model on a CPU and get the output. That's what I'm saying, CPU inferencing. You don't use a GPU. GPUs are very expensive, and it's also about managing these GPUs that's also important. See, that's where the whole, uh, you know, when I look at these blogs, not many of them actually talk about productionizing models because it's very difficult. Uh, it's also about maintaining it, right? There's a lot of engineering that's involved. And uh, so the thing is this, um, there is a person always called as a machine learning engineer who's actually an engineer who works with data scientists. And um, there is always a very funny lost in translation kind of conversations that go on. Like, because data scientists might not understand the engineering aspects of it. And the engineer might be like, okay, what's the big deal kind of an aspect of it. So it's an interesting thing, uh, but without engineering, right? Without your uh, putting in your plumbing for data and putting in your pipelines and your uh, infra for serving, it's very difficult to take a model to production and also to sustain it. For example, uh, what if you have like suddenly, so one of the things is that we productionized a model for mask reduction. So if you see uh, Swiggy, employ Swiggy delivery executives, right? They are supposed to, uh, whenever they check in, right? Whenever they start their duty, they have to do a, a mask compliance check. So we check whether they're wearing a mask or not. And only then they can start the duty, right? So when we do that, what happens is sometimes uh, at around 12 o'clock, they will not log in for lunch lunch duty right so at that 12 at 12 o'clock 12 12 30 sometimes it goes peak so you might get like 5000 or 6000 actually 5000 is less because uh, there are less orders also now because of covid but probably you can go to 7000 8000 requests per minute right so can you handle that uh, so which means when you're using docker it's not just docker you're basically going to use a kubernetes structure so kubernetes is very simple to understand it's like it's like uh, your web serving architecture, but then you have a Docker and then you tell, you basically understands, okay, this is the traffic that I'm coming through. And uh, how do I scale? Now I have like 10 machines that are handling it. That is, I'm load balancing with 10 machines. Can I scale up to 100 machines and load balance it? Right? So a Kubernetes is work, main work is that. That's what it does. Basically puts this Docker in different instances and you kind of, you know, fix it up and says, okay, fine, the API is ready now. Now I can start serving. Right. Uh, so your load balancing plus your cluster management is done by Kubernetes. So some people write a layer over Kubernetes uh, so that we can manage it, like the, the company itself can manage the way they want to manage. Uh, for example, again, let's say I want a, a machine that has more memory RAM. Okay. Uh, then I should probably tell my team saying that, can you use this kind of a instance where there are more, there is RAM like, you know, uh, 64 GB RAM or something else, or each instance has 64 GB or 32 GB or something. Or sometimes it could be that the compute is a lot more. Like I just I need a CPU that can really really compute faster. I don't care about memory here. So you say okay, compute is faster. Or sometimes you'll be like okay, fine. I just want a general kind of a thing, both good computing and I know good computing uh, uh, 
good compute platform plus a good uh, memory like you know around one eight GB or something like sixteen GB plus something of the sort. So it's also about designing that, and that's where a lot of engineering comes in. And uh, data science cannot exist in just a vacuum without engineering. Uh, so it's 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 both together. I hope Thank I you for saying that, uh, Bhavitra. As a ML engineer, I agree. Yeah, I I I kind of always make friends with ML engineers, so. You know, it makes life easier. <laughs> Not only that, it's just that I was an engineer myself. I used to work in Microsoft, and then I worked in C Sharp for two years, and then I lost interest in life. Kidding. So anyhow, so I, I quit, and then I tried different things, and then I started my startup. I I thought I'd never be going to be coding again, but looks like uh, computer vision and AI was very interesting, and I started doing that. But yeah, uh, I I can see DL deep learning is. Has at least forty percentage of engineering in it. It's not just you're running a Jupyter notebook, right? Yeah. C sharp can do that. Thank you, Nabrun. I know. I mean, yeah. No offense to C sharp. I was not working on ASP dot net, by the way. No, I, was... I mean, I, I think all offense due is is should be given. Okay, C sharp is horrible. <laughs> And I was working on Windows. Uh, what is that? WPF, WCF. WPF, yeah, WPF. Oh yeah, man. And then they have this million certifications that you have to do every quarter. I think the certifications did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was basically you know mugging up syntax, and I was like, I thought I was done with that in school. Anyhow, so yeah. A, a, any other question? Yeah. So I think uh, we have been very good on time. Um, and I think some people are uh, raising hands. As Anirudh tells me, um, I think I missed the raise hands. Anirudh, uh, can you? Yeah, yes. Okay, I'll just. Uh... Hi, I really think you know it built the appetite with the grandma and the sambar and the chapatis uh, coming in, yeah, and it's already one. I really appreciate it. Uh, my question is very simple. Uh, just wanted to know how you have made that diagram. Uh, you know, can you just go up the slide? Uh, you know, there were these matri matrix uh, that you were showing. This one. Uh, yes, this one. The one That's above from that. A, from a website, actually. I didn't. I, uh, the website is here. Sorry. Uh, not this one, uh, Pavitra. Can you just go a little down those uh, three vertical ones where you know they were just having? Uh, not not this one. I think it was a video, uh, sort of a GIF or something. The Nvidia, uh, the GAN. Ah uh, yes. Or uh, you're talking about this? Let me just show whatever I have. This one. Ah uh, no 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 not this one. No, those three vertical ones where you know uh, the matrices were overlapping each other and uh, likewise. This one. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, I think it was after the grandma. Oh, after the grandma. Hey, grandma was yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, one. yeah, yeah. this is from uh, mlblr.com. So, uh, actually, let me also talk about it, right? I'm not sure if he's doing it. Uh, there was, uh, check out mlblr.com. They run uh, something called as EIP, External Internship Program. Uh, there's this person called as Rohan Shravan. Uh, he does it. He's kind of a mentor to me. In the sense, I've not spoken to him in the last one and a half years, but I learned a lot from him. Uh, see, I am a self-taught person. Like, if you talk to data scientists, they would have a PhD or a, you know, a kind of. Not many people come from engineering background. They would have taken up some kind of a, you know, a statistical background or something of that sort, and then they would have come here. Uh, yeah. So, they have a check. I have a look at this mlbra.com. Some of the web, some of the concepts is explained really well. See if the EIP program is happening. Uh, so basically, he does it for free. I don't know how it's happening nowadays. So he does it for working professionals, and it happens in the morning. I'm not again not sure what's happening in that space. Probably can let you guys know later. But have a look at it. If you guys want to learn deep learning, right? Um, and uh, also you know keep learning your stuff. That's a good place to start. You might have to put in that effort, but uh, it's it's not like your typical textbook kind of uh, learning. You are hands on there. And that's the best way of learning deep learning, right? So where does that overlap? Okay, Santos. Okay, yeah, it does. I mean, the question was how do we productionize it, right? So how does it overlap? One of the ways in which overlaps is uh, optimizing your uh, 
your your model right uh, i am talking mostly from a perspective of this is where i wanted to kind of say that uh, from a deep when you're deep learning practitioner not talking about machine learning practitioner when you're deep learning practitioner you have to have to understand how this is going to be productionized you have to start thinking about that like for example you start working on a pytorch pytorch is again something like tensorflow kind of a framework and uh, it's getting gaining more popularity because it's more pythonic and uh, it's this is this, this really uh, how do you say uh, it's written in lua and on top of it you know you you have a torch framework is written in lua and then you have a python uh, wrapping over it uh, tensorflow again is written in c++ and then python wrapping over it so it, it differs uh, how these things are done but as a deep learning practitioner you have to understand which model you're going to take how long is it going to take uh, for example right uh, this is from my own i'm just taking from my own real life examples so google brought out this uh, network called as efficient net okay uh, it's a very interesting paper and uh, the way that the work that they've done is awesome amazing like you know it was all these all these architectures right they basically like for example a problem solving kind of a thing when you look at an architecture as a problem solving you would as an engineer you can really appreciate it so what happened was when i was showing an efficient net on let's say uh, a cpu or a, a very simple gpu and all right it was taking almost one second for inferencing so which means it's not going to be helpful for me and uh, let's say i'm going to train my model and everything on an efficient net and then i go to my uh, mle and say hey listen this is one second but can you bring it down what can the mle do right mle will definitely say okay he will try to do whatever he can from his end to optimize it let's say for example using the right cpu set or you know probably bringing in more compute uh, power into it etc but again it's up to the data scientist to optimize the model so for ml engineers the optimization is more about probably using uh, less number of features but which have more impact right so exactly so uh, that that's uh, yeah santos yeah, compass can is very interesting but i also had a reddit post saying that efficient net even he faces the same problem like mine he is not able to reproduce the same results that uh, google has put in now again i do not know that right probably it's also that i'm using a different gpu etc one of the biggest things about dl is that uh, reproducing a re research that they have done and getting the same kind of a result it's a lot of places i don't see it happening but now the kind of uh, rigor for it has come the discipline for it has come uh, that i can see a lot of uh, reviewers they don't accept papers without the code in it so yes uh, yeah i mean my only thing is a data scientist should also be a kind of a person who just can't say okay my job is only to train models it's also about understanding to some extent i won't call it full stack but at the same time understanding your architectures i think i'm sorry i don't want to use word architecture here but you understand your pipelines where is my data coming from and how is my ml going to use it you need to understand that do you have any more questions i guess not uh, if if there is please uh, leave it in the chat as well um, thank you so much pravita that was that was amazing and uh, really really good talk um for everybody else uh, so we have some time for open discussion uh, meanwhile i'm sharing a link which you can you know fill up to provide us feedback about our sessions today and also if you want to know more about bicon india uh, i'm leaving a link for that as well um do fill up the feedback form it will help us plan the future meetups better um now yeah. uh, the floor is yeah for you uh, and uh, as an aside right i i recognize that today's um, has been a bit uh, of a choppy experience some technical some non technical and i think that's all part of a meetup right when we have um, uh, maybe speakers who are is you know testing the waters I, i think the floor should be welcome uh, for everyone and because we were all uh, speakers first time speakers the first uh, like at some point of time right so um, the feedback while welcome i don't know different people take it differently uh, i think uh, it should it should be a little bit more diplomatic at least as far as online forums are concerned uh because you know uh, the tone does not come across you might be very helpful but 
the tone does not come across in chat so uh, i think uh, while welcome i think it definitely might be um, taken in different ways to different people uh, that said um, the the pycon um, india session right like last year also we had it that was the first time we started doing it right where we take in talks that are going to that are potentially going to be selected for pycon and we host them here so that people can get a feel for what a stage is like with a smaller audience so that when they go and talk to people 10x right it will be a lot more uh, smoother right? it might not scale proportionally in experience but it will be something rather than nothing right so i think that is part of what we are doing here and uh, i we will have a session in the first week of september as well where we are planning to use a platform called hopin which is the platform that we'll be using for pycon as well so uh, we'll have like you know this uh, procedures laid out on how to join and stuff that the experience is not very different it is just a different platform um and yeah if there are people who want to speak about uh, topics that you think are interesting anything goes okay anything that you use using python in your day to day operations to make your life easier or something that you use in your workspace or workplace um or maybe in a hobby project maybe in a side project you know we all have side projects i'm sure uh, so you, you should get in touch with me anirudh or ritesh we 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 keep on you know like almost chronically like uh, floating out a form where you can fill it in and uh, giving us topics uh, it was a bit of a you know a mad rush to get topics for image processing because we wanted to have all of them in the same theme and i really appreciate what uh, like i think i don't know if pavitra is still here but she uh, i reached out to her um, and uh, she was uh, most forthcoming and i'm happy to see how it is you know all uh, stitched the uh, experience i think so yeah uh, no there is no whatsapp group um, csc uh, but there is a slack channel there is a mailing list there is a meeting uh, meetup group um, so and there's a twitter uh, handle underscore underscore bank papers underscore underscore under so you can you can reach out to us on any of them the whatsapp group i don't think it, it would have been counterproductive i think because uh, like uh, we have one for volunteers so uh, that come brings me to another point right so we have a pool of volunteers who have yet been underutilized um, unfortunately because uh, the three of us have been uh, fairly able to bridge the gaps but i see more roles coming in the future where you know we need blocks to be filled in we need um, further topics to be mined and uh, we need um, i don't know general general discussion with the general interaction with the community at large because you know uh, we need to tell people that there is this is a place where people can ask questions and get answers any time regarding python and if you want to talk about something you need to know that this is available as a forum right uh, like i see that the, the participants always it has um, been heavy in the beginning and it dwindles towards the end because of a saturday and because of you know like multiple factors are there but i'm always happy with uh, whoever is there because uh, you know everyone matters so that is my small spiel um and if anyone has any topics that they want to talk about like any topics that they want to see or any topics that they want to talk about then please uh, the floor is open now Vinay is conveniently missing again, right? Like he was there for a long time, and I really wanted him to talk because uh, he's one of my favorite speakers. I should, shouldn't pick speaker like favorites as a all organizer, but uh, you know, I don't know. He gave us a five-hour talk, man. That counts for something. He's not here, but I suppose you'll have uh, Rahul. Do you have any more inputs? Navarun is here. He's one of our. Uh, he's one of the coordinators of pycon india and uh, is a veteran speaker and stuff so nabaran do you have any few words to say nothing much it was a great session today uh, like learning with examples was fun uh, in the last one hour uh, like great efforts on that front i would say and yeah really uh, well work done cool uh, ritesh anything uh no nothing on behalf that's right cool okay i think if there is nothing else um 
from yeah. a conversation point of view we can wind up now but if uh, if you have all filled up the survey form i am sure you'll have some strongly worded comments to say and uh, we we welcome that because you know every every word of comment or criticism helps us move a little bit forward in the journey it's not for nothing that we have uh, as a community we have been here for 15 years starting from when anand started the group to you know craze taking it up to now ritesh anirudh and myself like spearing heading it and we need volunteers further as well so please give us any feedback that you can pointedly regarding the talks or otherwise right and we will have some more talks in the future as well i i foresee um that we have how many more months september october now four months of which october will probably not have a session because pycon india is there september we will have two sessions one to try out hop in and one on the third week of september and one more in november and one in december so we'll have at least five more four more sessions so i uh, hope we can see you all and we'll have some interesting conversations uh, i i really uh, i was happy about how this took an interactive turn in the beginning despite the technical difficulties right like everyone pitched in like kanish and uh, vikash and uh, at least two more people that i'm i'm, I'm missing out i'm sorry uh, and uh, rahul and so thank you all for coming forward this is sort of where the direction we want to go in yeah so yeah we this was my first i think a bank paper meeting because i was pushing it from maybe an year or two but i'm um, happy that i could join yeah thank you i have to say the community yeah would be there yep and uh, we'll put out all the links we'll put out the blog uh, i'll be uh, publishing the blog sometime this, later this evening on the twitter cool. handle underscore underscore bank papers underscore underscore and i will also like send it out on the meetup group and everything so thank you all uh, see you at the next one Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. I will be the last to leave, so feel free to drop off.